All right, we'll call this general committee meeting to order. Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us this evening. I'm going to pass it over to uh, Mayor Leal um, for, for some comments. Mayor Leal. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair Beamer, and good evening. I want to take a few moments to recognize the coronation of King Charles III that happened on Saturday. The Dominion of Canada is part of the Commonwealth. The King is our head of state. While it's largely a symbolic or historical role with Canada as an independent country, it is important to mark and recognize this occasion in the history of our great nation. The King is represented in Canada at the federal level by our Governor General, Mary Simon, and provincially by Lieutenant Governor Elizabeth Dowswell. They are both truly impressive individuals who every day reflect the values of our wonderful country. While municipalities don't have a direct relationship with the Crown, at the local level, we're part of the provincial government, and so it's important to recognize the King's coronation here today. This was the first coronation in seven decades, the first in most of our lifetimes. For many people in our community, this was an event worthy of celebration. I want to recognize and thank them for their efforts to mark this historic occasion. However, for many others in our community, this coronation is a cause for reflection. The relationship of the First Nations, Inuit, Métis people with the Crown is one built on colonialism. The British Crown and the First Nations in Canada have treaties and a nation to nation relationships. Canadians are part of that history. In Canada, we're all treaty people. It is encouraging that King Charles recently met with indigenous leaders including Assembly of First Nations National Chief Roseanne Archibald, Inuit Contendinary President Nathan Obid, and Métis National Council President Cassidy Caron. I hope that the hard work required to build a positive relationship between the Crown and First Nations Inuit and Métis people will lead to reconciliation. The coronation is an opportunity to reflect on Canada's role in these agreements and relationships between the Crown and the First Nations in Canada, our obligations and commitments to the truth and reconciliation. As the city of Peterborough, we're also committed by doing our part to reflect on the wrongs of the past, to learn and to take action to move forward in achieving goals of truth and reconciliation. The city is privileged to have been involved in a local exhibition of birch bark baskets that were given to the Prince of Wales by Meishi Sawagi women in September 1860, when he visited Rice Lake Village, which is now Hiawatha First Nation, as part of the Cross Canada Royal Tour. These baskets are part of To Honor and Respect exhibit at the Peterborough Museum Archives on loan by the Royal Collection Trust on behalf of King Charles III through our partnership with local First Nations. The city is honored to support this nation's to nations effort. We want to recognize the Meishi Swagi and Chippewa Nations collectively known as the Williams Treaty's First Nations, which includes Curve Lake, Hiawatha, Alderville, Scugog Island, Rama, Beausoleil, Burley Falls, and Georgina Island First Nations. I also want to recognize those with Inuit and Métis heritage in our community. The city of Peterborough places a great value in the relationships that we built with you, and we look forward to continuing this important work. As we mark the coronation of Charles III and this milestone in our history of our country, let us collectively renew our commitment to engage with our indigenous peoples as we work together to achieve truth and reconciliation. I wanna close with a final sentence of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report. Quote, for Canadians from all walks of life, reconciliation is a new way of living together. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Mayor Leal, for that. Say, ah, it is just king.
And because this is an historic occasion, if we could everybody just, uh, the singers of the honor guard to stay right there, and members of council could move on the inner circle for a photo opportunity. I just uh, want to take a moment to uh, recognize Councillor Purnell uh, for her uh, extraordinary work of uh, uh, getting all this uh, uh, organized for us. Uh, and the event that was held yesterday, the Salvation Army, uh, at the gathering and the, uh, the Royal Lunch. Uh, uh, so I just want to recognize that. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Lil, for that speech. And uh, we will move on to our land acknowledgement. We respectfully acknowledge that we are on the treaty and traditional territory of the Mississauga and Anishinaabe. We offer our gratitude for the First Peoples for their care for and teachings about our earth and our relations. May we honor those teachings. We'll now take 30 seconds to reflect on these principles. Please stand for the singing of the national anthem.
and the Council for the City of Peterborough recognizes the principles contained in our Constitution and the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Madam Clerk, any disclosure between your interests this evening? Yes, Mr. Chair. Councillor DeGay. Thank you, um, Madam Clerk. Um, Mr. Chairman, I will be declaring an interest um, item 14A, the ministerial zone, zoning order request. Um, uh, a family member it, uh, represents the planning firm that is assisting with this uh, MZO initiative. Thank you. Great, thank you. And uh, when that comes up, we'll be ready. So thank you, uh, Councillor DeGay. All right, we have one report coming out of closed session this evening. License agreement that Council approved the recommendation outlined in report CSD 23-009 dated May 8th, 2023 of the Commissioner Community Service as follows. That respecting the license agreement between the City and the Peterborough Agricultural Society, staff be authorized to proceed as outlined in closed session report CSD 23-009 dated May 8th, 2023 from the Commissioner Community Service. Can I have a mover for that? Moved by Councillor Crowley. Any comments or questions? We will take a vote. And that is carried. So we'll move to our consent agenda. Committee members, let me know if you'd like to speak to any of the following items. 12A1, delegation request for AMO. Anyone wishing to speak to that? Seeing none. 12A2, member of council, staff relations policy. Anyone wishing to speak to that? Councillor Riel. 12A3, correspondence regarding ASICO airport appointment. Anyone wishing to speak to that? Or IS Mayor Leo? 12A4, 2022 Civic Awards. Anyone wishing to speak to that? Seeing none. 12A5, Transit Budget Considerations. Anyone wishing to speak to that? Councillor Leo? 12A6, Pre Commitment of Funds and Award, Lansdowne Street West Intersection Improvements. Anyone wishing to speak to that? Seeing none. And 12A7, transfer of funds in award Park Hill Road reconstruction. Anyone wishing to speak to that? All right. So up for consent this evening, 12A1, 12A4, 12A6, and 12A7. I have a mover, moved by Councillor Parnell, and we'll take a vote. And that is carried. We do have two presentations this evening. Our first one is uh, 11A, PCAD 2023 Q1 Strategic Plan Activities. And I believe we have Ms. Keenan. Ms. Keenan, welcome. Thank you for being here this evening. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and uh, General Committee. I'm pleased to be here um, to deliver the Q1 2023 activity report. In your package, there is a, a comprehensive list of activities in a narrative form, and then 
I will just go through our website um, that contains this quarterly report under our accountability section. So I'll just start with the first thing. This is just a, an overview, a little blog or my personal opinion on, on how we're growing the economy and just reflecting on the, um, the dollars and cents land use planning event that we were able to participate on and, and talk about what does it mean to help grow the economy. I'm just, how do I scroll? There we go. So our dashboard, which is something that uh, we report on regularly, wanted to give you an overview. We were able through the first quarter of January through March, help 10 businesses get started. 160 businesses were supported by PCAD. We helped 389 visitors. And then there were 24 investment inquiries that we responded to. And then um, from our friends at the Workforce Development Board, we were able to track 4,512 active job postings that were available throughout those three months of the first quarter of the year. So in the next section of this report, we talked about what we've been up to lately from PCAD to do the work that we're doing. There's been an awful lot of outreach. We attended and connected um, with tourism-based businesses with the Gross Morn Institute for Sustainable T um, Tourism. And that's really trying to help our tourism businesses develop new experiences so that we have new product to market to attract new visitors to the region. We attended the Ontario by Bike Cycle Tourism Summit. We attended the EDCO conference. Um, we were a judge at the Cubs Lair Entrepreneurship event. We hosted our own Starter Company Plus Showcase event for all of those entrepreneurs in the last couple of years that went through the program. We were a guest speaker at the Women's Business Network and we were talking about the customer personas and how that affects businesses and small businesses and how they can take advantage of that. Um, we also, again, um, talked about with, met with our marketing team at the airport to, to talk about how are we promoting promoting the airport and changing the airport profile. And then we also facilitated um, and worked with OMAFRA to host an economic development 101 training for those that were new in council. And so within our report, we have four objectives in our future ready plan. And that's a requirement of our strat plan and our MOU agreement that we have with this council. So the first objective is promoting Peterborough and the Corthes as a destination of choice to a number of key audiences. And so in 2022, you'll recall that I presented that we refreshed two websites. We did the Invest PTBO for investment attraction in small business, and we also have the Corthes.ca for tourism, and that's trying to attract visitors. The next phase, of course, is doing a social media refresh and making sure that we are talking to the right audience and saying the right things to the audience that, that we're talking to. So we also, we're with our new social media refresh, we were using our existing PTBO ECDEV Instagram and Facebook pages, and that's dedicated to supporting and celebrating small to medium sized businesses. Our PTBO ECDEV LinkedIn and Twitter pages, they were streamlined to communicate local business and investment related news, providing valuable information to highlight the community's benefits of doing business in the region aimed at an external audience. And then we also recreated new investment focused Instagram and Facebook social media accounts. And that's again to reinforce the invest PTBO campaigns as to be a destination of choice. You'll know that certain businesses want to hear different things. And sometimes when we have all of the information funneling through one or two channels, it does muddy the message. And so we were trying to be very clear and deliberate and follow best practices. So that was something that we did through the first quarter. And then of course, we always have our small business newsletter and click on this link right here. You're happy to take a read and uh, subscribe. We also wanted to just highlight, and again, there's a list of businesses in the narrative, or a list of the activities in the narrative report. We wanted to bring your attention to how we are um, promoting cycling. And I just thought that it would be important for you to see this type of information. Um, we are participating with Ontario by Bike Spring Cycling Campaign. And I thought a little bit of information for you to see that the average amount spent um, per trip by cyclists in Ontario is $404. And that's compared to um, just over 200 by non-cyclists. And so they spend the most on food, beverage, and overnight accommodation. And so I think it's important that we are trying to continue to attract cyclists into this region. Um, they're obviously paying, they're frequenting our businesses, and it's certainly something that we want to make sure that we're doing more of. And so we uh, partnered with Ontario Bike. We want to, um, we are having an annual cycling guide. There was a full print ad in English and French. It was distributed across Ontario, Quebec, Canada, and the USA. We have an e-newsletter um, advertising in March and April for cycling in Peterborough and the Corthes region. Uh, we also partnered in a partnership um, with Ontario Cycle Tourism Information Centers and four of those consumer shows that are geared towards cyclists, again, showcasing this region as a destination. 
And then I'll talk a little bit later about our showcase event for Starter Company Plus, but we hosted an event and then um, this is our entrepreneurship program. But we wanted to make sure that we were developing a relationship with Kortha now to highlight where these companies are coming from and how they are doing, just to show the ongoing success of this program that we run. So all each of these links is, is one article um, that we are partnering with Kortha now to highlight um, the new businesses that are in this community. So moving on to our second objective, which is attracting, growing, and retaining businesses in this region, levering, leveraging our mix of rural and urban assets. So we did receive 24 investment inquiries, and so I have a list of the type because I'm sure that will be a question. Um, there was a variety of, of inquiries, food processing, aerospace, tourism, accommodation, aquaculture, manufacturing, health and wellness, events and conferences, as well as retail inquiries were received. We also um, helped 62 tourism dependent businesses supporting them. We did have six leads that were lost. We did serve those 389 visitors and we were able to host four sporting events in the region. So when I look at the business development inquiry overview, what are businesses calling us and asking us about? It's about available funding and grants. Um, they are looking for support. We're seeing that more and more as a lot of the COVID-19 programs are coming to an end. Businesses are looking at financing and funding opportunities and, and what they can do. Um, we are having a lot of uh, inquiries about industrial buildings. Um, and in this quarter, we received uh, um, inquiries received from 8,000 square feet to 40,000. That is just in this um, three months. Every month it changes and every inquiry is different, but that's what we received this quarter. Um, employers are also asking for hiring support. Um, they're always looking at data reports and regarding full-time and part-time employment, and then inquiries seeking how we can assist them in making connections with it for, to advance their business. Um, we've been helping businesses grow. We've done some startup visa presentations through the Innovation Clusters program. Um, we did submit an application for RED funding for an agriculture sector project. Uh, we did submit an application on behalf of a consortium for an electric vehicle demonstration zone project in collaboration with Trent Fleming and three other um, post-secondary institutions. Unfortunately, we weren't successful in that application, but we have started to regroup to say, how can we deliver it on a smaller scale um, to be able to continue to advance that work? Um, we also uh, were a participant in the annual Aer aerospace summit. And again, um, we are currently uh, attended a restaurant show in, uh, in Toronto last month, and we are at a restaurant show again, CL, um, today, tomorrow, and Tuesday, or Wednesday, sorry. Okay. Moving on to the next one. Our objective three is on workforce development. You've heard me speak a lot about workforce development. Um, it has been a big piece of the workflow, and we did close two significant projects in the end of March. So in our Pathways to Prosperity project, we were able to help 52 businesses engage um, we were able to help 308 people retrain and improve their skills so that they were more employable, um, whether that was just entering or re-entering the workforce or whether it was you already have a job but you need to move up the ladder. And so those 308 businesses were, or um, job seekers were trained through Fleming College and then um, connected with our local businesses. In the Trent Community Concierge Program, we were able to secure commitments from 33 different businesses that are looking to create experiential learning opportunities for students and or hiring graduates afterwards uh, with Trent. And so that was a very successful program as well. And again, um, pointing out that there were a number of job postings that were active during this, this quarter. I do want to highlight, though, one of the work within the career ladder, the creation of the career ladder program, and that was part of the Pathways to Prosperity. I know this is a little busy, but what we wanted to showcase was that there is always a start and there's a ladder for each of our key sectors. So whether it's agriculture, construction, food service, or manufacturing, there is a pathway for better jobs. And so, yes, you may start at the beginning, um, but there are different pathways and different courses that we can help you navigate through to be able to move up that ladder. This is just a snapshot of some of the tile cards but what it is is it is interactive and it does connect directly to our job boards with the workforce development board to showcase where the jobs are in this region at each of those pay scales and what's available throughout the region so this has been a best example other communities are copying this example and I think it's it's great for our community to show that there's progress and potential and I also wanted to bring to your attention our employer profile. Um, and I, I won't play the video because I know that you have a tight um, agenda this evening. But 
this one in particular I really enjoy from Charlotte Products because it does talk about how somebody did start as a temporary worker, was able to move up the chain and, and stay working here in this community. So part of our program was also trying to highlight our key employers, the job opportunities that are available to them and how they're committed as well to helping people move up um, in through their workforce development. And then finally, our objective four is about startups and entrepreneurship. So we responded to 88 inquiries for people wanting to start their own business. We did 46 um, BAC consultations. So that's for individuals that actually have started a business but need a support and assistance and where do they go next. Um, we actually had 10 businesses launch during this time period and we hosted 13 different workshops. So we've also done presentations to groups, groups like employment planning and counseling, EPC, to provide workshops on how to support individuals through self-employment and what's available. Um, and then we also, um, had, we were a guest speaker on the third and fourth year business students at Trent University to talk about the importance of being able to do a business plan and a business pitch. Um, and then again, we did our starter company plus showcase. That's our entrepreneurship program. Um, we were very sad that usually after the end of our, our starter company plus we have a showcase where we're able to showcase everybody who went through the program. But of course, with COVID, it was a virtual event. And so we said we want to do this with a big bang. And uh, so we were able to highlight all of our success stories from 2020 to 2022 in one evening. So it was wonderful. And thank you for those that, that were able to show, to show up. We also plan a few tax workshops. I know that really wasn't a, a favorite of, of businesses to take part in. They much more prefer to go to marketing workshops, but we know how important tax workshops are. And so we partnered with the CRA to make sure that we were able to deliver that and help prepare our businesses. Um, I'll scroll quickly through these. These are all of the events that we were hosting throughout um, the first quarter to support business. Then I know some of the conversations that we've talked about of what are businesses asking about, again, funding, um, helping uh, to find new space, hiring workers, um, support on utilizing and enhancing their social media presence, how do they market, tax filing, um, experiential development coaching for tourism-based businesses. And then um, what we're also finding is our businesses are saying there's so much information out there, help me streamline this down and, and, and consolidate our thoughts and to be able to advance our business. Um, some of the barriers to business that we experienced this quarter, um, no surprise, workforce, and of course, I, I've certainly talked to this council many times about regional employment lands and infrastructure, but I wanted to highlight a new one that, that is starting to surface, and that's insurance and risk mitigation. A number of our events, um, the, the community groups and grassroots organizations that do want to host events in this region, they are starting to get um, faced with increasing insurance premiums and insurance requirements that they're not able to meet. And so that is going to impact the number of events that we're able to host and have in the, in the region. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention that there have been a few um, groups that have, we've, they've had to say no that they can't operate here. And that is not just a Peterborough situation that is something that that many municipalities are facing across the province um, and then I think just some of the information that we have requested by visitors certainly they're talking about attractions festivals and events arts and culture and heritage food and drink sports and recreation shopping farmers markets and parks and trails um, and then finally, I just wanted to complete opportunities for business and what we are seeing where there's some opportunities for us to grow our economy through the electric vehicles. And again, that was part of our um, submission for funding that we are working with with some post-secondary institutions. Um, sustainability and adding a circularity to our economy is, is something that we are pursuing. Food processing, there's a number of food processors that are certainly um, have expressed an interest in being in the region. And of course, being at the CL show this week, we're, we're going to be looking at that as well. Agritourism. Tourism, um, aviation and aerospace at the airport, and then earned media and influencer relations are something that we're going to be looking at for the rest of this year. And that is the end of my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Ms. Keenan. That was great. I think we do have some questions. Mayor Leal? Uh, thanks very much uh, through Mr. Chair to uh, Toronto. Thank you very much uh, uh, for your presentation. Uh, my first question is, I, I should know the answer to this, but I'm not. Does the Canadian Canoe Museum has a designation as a national museum or will it get that designation? Do, do we know that? Through the chair, I should probably know this as well, but I believe it is yes, um, but I will confirm that and get back to you. So if I can uh, proceed, so when this, when it opens in, in this fall, the Canadian Canoe Museum is probably one of the most significant pieces of tourism infrastructure 
throughout Canada. Will there be a specialized marketing program uh, to bring the world to Peterborough? Thank you for that question. And yes, they're always, we do work very closely with the Canadian Community Museum. We certainly incorporate them into a lot of our marketing efforts and our work. And certainly we will work, continue to work closely with them with, with marketing campaigns to help highlight. I think once we actually know when the date is for opening, I think we'll be able to put those plans in place. Mr. Chairman, if I can uh, just continue on for a moment um, through Ms. Keehan and the, um, the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment for the province of Ontario, um, uh, Mr. Fidelli recently sent a, an inquiry sheet to all municipalities in Ontario in terms of whether uh, there would be employment ready, 29 to 30 acres. Uh, uh, the reality is uh, we can't respond to his inquiry because we don't have that. So in your um, presentation, this evening, you talked about you had inquiries over the last three months of companies looking for uh, square footage between 8,000 and 40,000 square feet. How many companies? Can you put a, a number on that? Um, so through the chair, if I can clarify that question, uh, Mayor Leal, are you looking at how many? How many were companies we're looking for between 8,000 and 40,000 square feet in our community? So out of those 24 inquiry set, 24? we had, tw sorry, we had 24, but some of them were for retail space. So there okay. were a few in retail, but I would say there are usually about five to six each month that that would fit in that category. Uh, if I could just continue then, what, did you say four or five of them would have been manufacturers? Yes. Okay. And I'm classifying, sorry for clarity, I'm also including food processing within that manufacturing base. So uh, through you, Mr. Chair, then uh, Rhonda, we're missing out on enormous opportunities on a regional basis. Absolutely, yes. Uh, my last question, uh, Mr. Chair, through you to Rhonda is, are you sharing this uh, uh, with the County of Peterborough, this yeah. report? Absolutely, yes. This Wednesday or? Um, I believe it's next Wednesday. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Mayor Leal. Councillor Hakey, questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, Rhonda, for your presentation. Uh, I know all too well the, what we lack, um, industrial space, for those that aren't aware, I've seen in five years it change from about $6 a foot to almost $15 a foot right now. And that speaks to the fact that you can't get any. And the sweet spot is anything up to 10,000 feet. Um, but a question on the electric vehicles and the food processing. Um, are they still interested? And if they are, what are they looking for? Are they looking for land to develop or factory space? Through the chair. So, so for clarity, um, we did not receive an electric vehicle inquiry in that last quarter. I'm identifying electric vehicle as a potential opportunity for us to pursue. So it, a little bit of a distinction that, that we would be going after them. And so the electric vehicle um, was looking for us to be a demonstration pilot project and working with our post-secondary institutions to showcase this and, and, and as a means to be able to attract future uh, businesses in that in that field. From the food processing perspective, um, sorry, your question was... What do they need what from they need? us as a region? They need land, they need service, and they need a to be able to pull a building permit for all intents and purposes. So it's service land, more for than likely industrial. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So certainly if, um, for other companies like distribution and logistics, certainly they don't require the same amount of servicing, um, but certainly the employment numbers are not as high in a logistics and distribution center as it would be elsewhere. So that would be the clarity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Hickey. Councillor Burke. Thanks. Thank you, through Chair Beamer, um, to Ms. Keenan. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the liability and insurance aspect of this because um, it's one thing that I'm hearing a lot of from, I, I work downtown every day and I'm connected to um, small business owners downtown. Um, for our patio program that we did, the city did, we asked that the restaurants provide that liability insurance. And I know that um, a couple of the big major restaurants that are like that are that are downtown um, backed out of that program because of the excessive um, insurance and liability costs. Um, so, and and I've also heard that to do with festivals to shut down streets, um, 
you know, for the for people involved to take on those costs, it's just too much, and it's prevented um, the downtown from doing some really great things. Do we have like a strategy on that? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, part of my strategy is is talking about them here at these quarterly meetings to sort of talk about what what hurdles we are facing when we are trying to support these businesses and event organizers. And so I think part of it is, you know, recognizing that that there are you know, insurance is required and, and there certainly are, are rules and, and regulations in place. But I think where we're struggling are events in the that just are not able to financially secure the, t the type and the level of insurance required um, is, is a bit of a struggle. And so I think what that means is we're either going to be limited to those events that are large and pre-planned and have that, that uh, financial backing ahead of them or uh, find some other way to help support them in, the, in that insurance. And so I think I know the DBIA has certainly been very active in, in promoting this and, and talking about it, but um, we're open to coming to the table to discuss any options if, if there's an opportunity for us to participate. Thank you very much, Councillor Burke. Any further questions? Councillor DeGay? Thank you, uh, Chair Beamer. Um, Rhonda, thank you for your, uh, your informative presentation. Um, in your, um, one of your, uh, on your background, it references, uh, uh, it, it, you referenced a future ready document, and then you go on to say about four key objectives to deliver regional economic development growth, support city and county, and then you speak to the respective official plans. Now, our official plan was updated by the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing after you produce your future ready document. Will it will a future ready document need to be fine tuned to reflect the newly minted official plan, City of Peterborough? Thank you, through the chair. Um, I think our future ready plan was identified that it needs to follow and support the city's official plan. There weren't, a, the, the job targets were recognized at that time. So there may be some adjustments in the number that we are going towards based on, on, the, on the new OP. Um, but overall, the intent is, is still there and should not need to be updated. Thank you. Any further questions? Ms. Keenan, as always, thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. Our pleasure. All right. So we do have a recommendation to receive for information. Councillor uh, Councillor Hakey, any comments or questions? All right. We'll take a vote. And that is carried. Thanks, everyone. Our second presentation, Homelessness Service Strategy and Update. And uh, Commissioner Laidman, you want to make a few comments? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. If I could just uh, preliminary um, comments and introductions here. Uh, so staff have been directed through a number of motions of council earlier this year to come to council with information on homeless programs. Uh, and most importantly, a strategy on addressing the growing homelessness situation in the city. Uh, in addition to that, the city has been recently provided with additional homeless funding from the province. So this report that you have in front of you today provides an overview of an, an, a revised approach to homelessness, but also provides an immediate, medium term and longer term perspective on, on providing that approach to address homelessness in tandem with the increased funding opportunity. Uh, so I'll introduce uh, Rebecca Morgan Quinn, who's the new Social Services Division Director uh, as of last week, and uh, Jocelyn Blazy, who's the Manager of Homelessness Programming, who will be providing a presentation to Council over the main elements of the plan and the report. Um, thank you for the opportunity today. Um, I do want to emphasize from the outset that what we're talking about is a concept it's a high level concept. If we have council's approval to move forward with the concept, we have a lot of details to work out, but we have spoken to community partners um, in a general way about what this could look like. And um, we will get started working as soon as we have that approval. So I'll start with the city's role in homelessness. Um, okay. If if you could just move maybe up move up the or the table, yeah. Thank you. 
Great. Thanks, Rebecca. Okay. Is that better? Uh, so the city is the service manager for housing and homelessness in the city and county. And um, Ontario is the only province where housing was downloaded from the province to municipalities. So it makes sense from a municipal level to have the decision making to rest at that level. But it is without sufficient funding, it's extremely challenging to make headway on the goals in our 10 year housing and homelessness plan. We are required to have a 10 year housing and homelessness plan and we're required to work towards the goals, which do include reducing or ending uh, homelessness. So we, as I say, we have a requirement, um, but we don't have sufficient resources. It means that it's more th important than ever that we direct those funding resources that we do have control over towards the outcomes that are, are within our mandate. We understand that homelessness is complex and the underlying causes of homelessness include mental health and addictions, um, but those services are funded through health and are outside of the mandate. We do need to work in alignment with health. We do need to urge the province to provide health supports so that we can align them with housing that we create, but we need to, to use our available funding towards um, the goals that are in our plan that are about ending chronic homelessness. And this next slide you may have seen before. I can, oops, sorry. Is uh, the housing continuum from homelessness to home ownership. Uh, as a service manager, our primary role is really uh, on the uh, right up to market rental housing. Um, but for the purposes of this report and this presentation, uh, we're really focused on that left-hand side of the continuum from homelessness through emergency shelters and transitional housing. And I'll also say that this is not a linear journey for many folks. Um, they may be moved into transitional housing and struggle there and return to shelter or return to homelessness, um, but that we are trying to move them towards permanent, permanent housing um, but recognizing that this can be uh, a, a long journey for some and can take a few tries. And some folks are simply too unwell. They may not be able to stay in shelter um, because of mental or physical illness. And I know that one of the requests uh, as part of our request for a presentation was about housing first. And so we wanted to give some background. I think it's important to understand that Housing First is both a program and a principle. So the principle is that housing is not contingent on readiness or compliance, but it's also a program which would incorporate rent supplements, uh, access to housing and health supports. All of the resources in our system that are connected to the coordinated access and by name priority list operate on housing first principles. People are not required to be clean and sober to access housing and they're not required to have graduated from a program in order to access housing. Uh, and I'll say too that staff were recently at an AMO conference on ending homelessness and every pre presentation discussed the importance and success of implementing a housing first approach. So there are models that are working in other areas um, but, and we are continuing to try to use Housing First as a principle. The struggle is when we don't have sufficient resources to make it work um, as it should. I'll give a couple of examples of Housing First um, where, and we, because we know that it works in practice. At Home Chez Soi was actually a research um, study that looked at Housing First as a program. Could it work? Could moving folks from directly from homelessness into housing with supports actually have a better outcome than actually than asking them to graduate through various readiness programs? The kinds of supports that were available to at Home Chez Soi in Toronto, for example, um, included uh, the assertive community treatment team, which included psychiatrists and nurses. And these were this was what was determined to be the most effective solution for people with high or very high acuity. So these folks were very complex cases that had um, significant needs in order to stay housed. In, 
in Helsinki, in Finland, um, they they have an interesting scenario because the city of Helsinki actually owns 70% of the property in the city. Uh, and seven out of 10 residents in Helsinki actually live in community housing. And these are folks from all income levels. So we can see that in both scenarios, there's a real need for a high level of support, but also the availability of housing to make it work as a program uh, across the system. And I think in Helsinki, they said, you can't have housing first without housing first. Like you have to start somewhere. And that's one of our biggest challenges. So our system uses the principles, but the success of it is all predicated on the availability of housing and the availability of the appropriate housing for folks' needs. I'm going to turn it over to Jocelyn to talk a little bit about um, data analysis and the by name priority list. Thanks, Rebecca. Perfect. So this slide just highlights some of our data on our by name priority list or what we commonly refer to as our BNPL. Um, it should also be noted that um, we're required by the province to have a by name priority list and participate in coordinated access system. And while we recognize that the system isn't perfect, we also recognize that there's room for improvement, but it is a system that's being used across the country by the, and being uh, recommended by the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness and Built for Zero Canada and also utilized by other countries such as the United States, Australia, and New Zealand. And when I'm talking about the by name priority list, I often find myself using medical analogies because often most of us have at some point touched the healthcare system if we haven't touched the homelessness system. And what we're trying to do with our by name priority list is really understand who is the highest level of need and be able to triage them and be able to support them in our system. The problem is that we don't often have enough high support housing that's needed to help the individuals in our community. Often these are individuals with complex co-occurring needs, which puts them in what we would call high or very high acuity or high or very high level of need. And as you can see on this slide, and I will acknowledge that this is the numbers here are as of April 15th for the report. So our by name priority list is actually updated every day. But as of the report, uh, there are 302 unique individuals on our by name priority list. And I also want to highlight the number of individuals who are chronically homeless. So more than 50% of those individuals have been experiencing homelessness for six months or more within the last year. And 56% of them are high or very high acuity. I also wanted to highlight um, something we're starting to see in terms of our aging shelter system. It's a trend that I don't think is unique to Peterborough. Um, but as you can see on this slide, these are the number of individuals who are currently in our shelter system who are over the age of 55. And on the left are a list of different diagnoses for these individuals. I'll also acknowledge that a lot of our individuals who are, are seniors and staying in shelter have more than one item on that left list that they're trying to, to work through. Essentially, our shelters are becoming long-term care homes. The health, there's a pressures on the healthcare system, there's pressures on the homelessness system, and individuals are staying in our shelter um, where they're pro being provided supports by shelter workers, not healthcare professionals. So it is causing a bit of an um, inflow and outflow gap in our shelter system at the moment. And the last data slide is looking at um, some encampment data. So as of April 15th, there were 53 individuals identified as sleeping outside on the by name party list. Our social services outreach staff did an enumeration for two weeks in March, and they actually identified at least 62 individuals just staying at Wolf Street alone. Of that, eight individuals were under the age of 25 and six individuals were over the age of 55. Again, acknowledging the increasing age of individuals we're starting to see experiencing homelessness. And I also want to point out that 50% of those individuals have been homeless for four years or more. Again, just acknowledging the complexity and the length of time that people have been experiencing homelessness in our community. And I also want to acknowledge that this was an enumeration that our social services staff did, but we consulted with other community partners. And these were numbers that, were, um, that they were acknowledging as well. So again, the needs are complex and we have some gaps in our system that aren't able to meet those needs. And I'll hand it back to Rebecca. 
So um, this report was intended actually to be scheduled earlier in the year, but in the meantime, we got a funding announcement that has slightly changed our planning. Um, and it's really allowed us to shift our thinking on how we can respond to homelessness, both in the short and in the long term. So um, homelessness prevention plan funding is annualized funding, and I'll get into the numbers in the next slide, but uh, it's annualized funding and we've received an additional allocation of about $2.49 million um, for the next three years. So that's in each year, and we know our allocation for the next three years. So we know that we can't continue to respond to homelessness only as an emergency. We know we need to plan towards the future, but we also know we, that we can't not respond to homelessness in our community. We need to do both. And with this new funding, combined with some other changes, we have an opportunity to do that. So this is our status quo funding um, where we're currently spending. Um, emergency shelters includes the Brock Mission, Yes Shelter for Youth and Families in Cameron House. You'll see the overflow shelter lower down on the slide. The supportive housing refers to, uh, includes 15 supportive transitional housing units provided at the Brock Mission, as well as the Cameron House um, semi-independent living units and units in the private market that are supported by Forecast, John Howard Society, and the Elizabeth Fry Society. Housing assistance is both rent supplements and homelessness prevention programs like Housing Stability Fund, which helps people pay uh, for rental arrears or utility arrears or last first and last month's rent. Very important piece of preventing homelessness. Um, and I'll just go through some of the changes that we're looking at. So uh, it was announced a few weeks ago that service managers would re receive an additional, an increase in our HPP allocation, our homelessness prevention program allocation. Uh, and that the funding must be spent on programs and services that will prevent, divert, address, or reduce homelessness. And I mean, two point, almost $2.5 million does seem like a lot of funding, um, but in another way, it's relatively small when we're looking at the size of the problem that we're trying to solve. So we are looking at this funding in concert with other funding programs that we have to try to rethink how we're doing, uh, how we're supporting people who are experiencing homelessness um, and balance some of the needs of the community as well. So we're looking at all the funding that we have in the system. Um, and one of the pieces is that St. John's notified staff that they were going to end the one roof contract um, at the end of this year. So we saw that as a, an opportunity to leverage it and prioritize it to, to change the way that we're supporting folks who are experiencing homelessness. And as I said, at the same time, as we're looking at um, an immediate response, we're also looking at medium and long-term um, plans to try to actually move closer to permanent supportive housing, which is really the end goal for a lot of these folks. But in the shorter term, in the medium term, we're looking at reviewing the HPP funding, understanding where we're spending it and understanding if all of that spending is in alignment with our goals, looking at community grants that are provided under social services to ensure again that we're there working in alignment with our goals, we're looking at contributing to a, a pot of funding that we can build towards building permanent supportive housing. We know that that's a longer timeline. We're looking at our existing social housing to understand how it could potentially be repurposed. And we're re reorient excuse me, reorienting our staff. Um, employment is no longer part of what social services division does. I want to the staff on my former teams that housing is the new employment and it's that important and we need every single staff person that touches clients to understand that maintaining their housing is our one of our most important jobs because if they are evicted if they lose their housing it's going to be their lives are going to be that much more difficult um, so as i said we know our end goals need to be permanent supportive housing we need to construct more affordable housing and we need to connect any builds that we create to health and mental health. Um, but these, these pieces will take time. 
and we need to respond in the short term as well and stabilize people so that we can move them towards those end goals. So uh, I'm going to sort of give you the summary slide and then Jocelyn's going to dig into the individual pieces, but these are four key initiatives that we're looking at to um, try to address the immediate needs, but also the needs of the neighborhood. So the four key initiatives we have are using, and again, this is high, con high level concept. So what this will actually look at like on the ground is the next step in, in our planning, but will be modular units to provide a different kind of shelter. These are not homes. Um, they may be a, a form of bridge housing or a different form of shelter, but basically a non-congregate type shelter to allow people to stabilize a navigation hub in the building at 210 Wolf Street. We're also looking at a 24 seven winter drop-in space and looking at how can we uh, change the conversation? How can we support folks in the neighborhood better so that this uh, can be better integrated with the neighborhood? And I'm going to pass it over to Jocelyn. So again, I just want to acknowledge that these next four slides are really focused on an immediate concept proposal. Um, I also want to acknowledge the community support of the providers that were listed in the report. And I also want to acknowledge Peterborough Public Health, who wasn't included on the report, but who has given their support for this concept. Um, and in terms of the report, it was an intentionally left as a concept because we wanted to have council approval before moving forward. And we wanted to get the opportunity for city staff to work with community partners, clients, and the neighborhood to develop the best plan possible um, to meet the current needs. So we recognize that shelter doesn't work for the most complex individuals, either due to preference or due to their needs. The idea behind the modular units is to provide an alternative form of shelter that will be able to meet those basic needs of the individuals who are currently living outside. There's recognition that we will also have to provide services to meet the basic needs of the clients, including bathrooms, showers, and laundry. In addition, there has been some thought given to providing individuals with access to storage for their personal belongings. So for instance, the individuals who walk around downtown with their shopping carts, is there a possibility for us to give them some storage to keep those carts during the day and or the storage for the belongings of the individuals who might utilize these modular units? hoping to also better help with uh, downtown. In order to support the individuals who will be accessing these units, we also recognize we'll need 24 seven security on, so on site and intensive supports to help stabilize the clients. We think the provision of physical units in one location while basic needs being met will support stabilization of clients and in turn other potential future housing opportunities that might become available. In following the housing first approach, while this might not be permanent housing, we know that a physical stable structure is the first step in supporting individuals towards stabilization. The second initiative is a navigation hub. So we see this concept as an opportunity to also create a central navigation hub for all of the agencies who are currently providing outreach to the individuals who are currently at Wall Street and or outside in the community. If modular units are going to be placed at Wolf Street, there's an opportunity to better utilize our overflow funding and turn the Wolf Street building into a hub where agencies can have office space to meet with the clients where they're at. It'll also make it a lot easier for outreach clients to find, for outreach, sorry, to find clients and for clients to connect with outreach agencies. Furthermore, we see this as a conduit to support increased collaboration and case management amongst community partners leading to increased stabilization supports and hopefully transitions to other options. And again, uh, I was recently at the AMO symposium on um, ending homelessness. And I don't know if anyone is following the stuff in London, but they're doing some really uh, innovative work. And part of that is investing in navigation hubs in their community. The third one is 24 seven winter drop-in space. So, um, while we're proposing modular units in addition to the current shelter bed numbers, we also recognize that there's a need for 24 seven drop-in space for some of the most vulnerable individuals in the community. Stopgap was a 24 seven drop-in space that was operational this past winter and was at capacity almost every evening, if not over. There's recognition that there needs to be an emergency space that clients can access in the winter, especially due to the serious health related concerns of sleeping outside in the winter. 
for instance, frostbite and also potential deaths. Social services operated a temporary evening warming space. Rebecca and I were there at Christmas and saw firsthand the complexity of individuals who can't stay in shelter, but need somewhere to stay alive and warm. And finally, neighborhood support. So we recognize the impact of Wall Street in the neighborhood um, and the surrounding area. And we see this as an opportunity to better engage with the neighborhood. Our proposal includes neighborhood and community supports, potentially looking at how we can better structure the area. So for instance, fencing improvements, like maybe a wood fence, um, and hopefully the modular units will also be more visually appealing as opposed to the tents themselves. Um, the provision of services like basic needs might help uh, support the neighborhood as well with the provision of bathroom, showers, laundry services, uh, as, long as, regular, as well as regular cleanup for garbage. And in terms of Wolf Street itself, we did explore other locations and the report recommends that this concept stay at Wolf Street for the following reasons. So the land is city owned, which does allow for some flexibility and significant zoning benefits. Wolf Street is located close to downtown, which is where services are that clients would regularly access, including social services, CMHA, Forecast, and the Safe Consumption site. There are significant concerns that if something is developed that is far away from the downtown core, individuals will uh, not choose to access those sites and go back to the downtown core. It's also beneficial from a support staffing perspective because a lot of those agencies are located downtown as well. And in terms of a navigation hub or a potential 24 seven drop in space or supports to the modular units, the Wall Street building has already been retrofitted to meet the needs of clients and agencies while also meeting building and fire codes. It also has office spaces for outreach agencies to meet with clients, has a shower, bathrooms and other attributes which make, make it a successful and potential good, uh, location opportunity. By being downtown and in a space that is regularly accessed by clients, again, it allows outreach staff to keep better track of clients, which allows them to actually spend more time supporting those clients instead of looking for them all over the community. And overall, the goal is to provide a better option for both the neighborhood and the clients who are currently sleeping outside while also meeting them where they're at. And finally, the report also includes support for any alternative locations in addition to the Wool Street concept presented here tonight but staff feel strongly that Wolf Street is the best location for this concept proposal. So just in closing, I just, I think I've said this a few times, but I'll emphasize that this is a crisis response, the bulk of what we're proposing, but it, it's a different response than any we've tried before. Um, but homelessness in 2023 looks different than it did um, even as recently as when we were designing the, Brock, the new Brock mission. Um, we know that people need permanent supportive housing. We also know that we don't have sufficient units or sufficient units of support in our community. It will take time to build, but we're committed in alignment with our community partners to working with people in crisis to become more stable so that this stability could be the first step in, uh, in the housing continuum for them. So thank you very much for your time. Great, thank you very much. So if, did you wanna do maybe questions and then debate or did you wanna do them together? Doesn't matter, I'm, okay. So is it all right if we just keep you there and is that all right? So we'll do questions, everyone, and then we'll open it up to debate. So questions, Councillor Riel, Burke, Vasily, Addis, Baldwin, Hakey. Councillor Riel, questions for the presenters? Um, through the chair, I don't have any questions. I'll move the report at the time, and, and then I will speak on it. Okay, so I'll come to you first, Councillor Burke, second, when we get to recommendations. So questions, Councillor Vasily, Addis, Baldwin, Hakey, Mayor Leal. Councillor Vasily, Addis, questions? Thank you, Chair. Um, I see the word hub in, in in the report and you mentioned navigation hub. So that's gonna intensify that area and meeting more people in the area. So you did mention um, that you wanted to, to engage with the neighborhood. So how do you plan on engaging with the neighborhood and the neighbors in the area just to hear their concerns? Yeah, uh, we can help you, Mr. Chair, yeah. if I could jump in on sure. that first sure, yeah. here through uh, for Councillor Vasiatis. Um, clearly there hasn't been time to do a traditional consultation at this point and obviously before proceeding with this important thing we wanted to make sure we were bringing it to council's attention but i do think there's an opportunity 
to engage the public going forward. Um, certainly some concepts that have been discussed are an advisory kind of committee of, of neighborhood residents and, and providers coming together to talk about specifics. That's one thing. Um, certainly, I know it would be at a minimum staff's expectation to try to uh, reach out to property owners and, and neighborhood to seek their in, involvement in terms of the detailed planning as we go into this as to how the site may look, um, the features of the site, how we can design it. Um, so those are certainly some of the things that staff are considering at this point. And just one more question too. Um, so if the report or recommendation it passes, um, at what point are we willing to call this a permanent location? And the only reason I ask that is that I've had uh, many constituents in that area reach out to me and businesses asking the question, is it permanent? And the reason I think some of them are asking it is that so they can plan for the future on whether they want their business there, whether they want to move it or, you know, uh, in general, just knowing uh, what the future is for that location. Uh, if I can, through you, That's Mr. Good. Chair. I think the intention for sure is that this not be a permanent location. However, I don't believe staff would be able to commit to a time frame at this point, as was discussed in the presentation. It would be ideal that the site get weaned off its intensity to move to other sites as, as, um, as supportive housing becomes available and that the site become less intense over time and uh, so that it does not become a permanent feature. Uh, but certainly staff would not want to commit to what that time frame could be at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much for that, Councillor Vasliadis. Uh, questions, Councillor Baldwin? Get you going. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation uh, and the report. Um, I've spent um, several hours kind of going over it, and I had, as you spoke, I had more questions than the, I know there are answers, but I'll, I'll ask three, three questions. Um, this first statistic that you, you included tonight um, said that there were 62 people living at the Wolf Street location. And the question I have around that is, are those people who are at the Wolf Street location, are, is that a combination of people living in the rough in tents and residing in the temporary shelter? Could you break that down a bit for me, please? Through you, Chair. I can do my best while also acknowledging that if it, it, it's a hard group to do an enumeration on if you're not there 24 seven. It's a transient population. Um, I would say that more than 90% of those individuals are individuals who are not accessing any other shelter. Those are individuals who are exclusively staying outside. Yeah, that, that's helpful. Um, I just, the other question, again, I don't know if you, you can answer it, but as you spoke, it, it, I, you were saying that of that um, group, there were several of those people who have been homeless for more than four years. And it's kind of connected to the by name, group, by name priority list. So the, what came to mind when you were talking about that was how you focus your energies on that group. Do you focus on people who have, been, who have become recent, just, just recently homeless, thinking that that newest group might be, you might be able to accommodate their needs if they've been recent people on the list or finding themselves in a homeless situation as opposed to focusing your attention on those who have been homeless for significant amounts of time, even though I know you've said it's not linear. They go into and out of homelessness, if you will. Could you, could you speak to that in some sense? Because I'm, I'm not sure of the answer. Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think if I can go back a slide. Sorry, this is, if you think of this as our housing continuum, if you look at homelessness on the left, emergency shelters, transitional housing, 
Those are three, but there's actually also a prevention and diversion piece that's on the left um, and permanent supportive housing on the right. And I think what we're trying to do as a system is exactly that, is balance the need of prevention and diversion so someone never becomes homeless again because the only indicator of an experience of homelessness or for someone to become homeless is a previous experience. It's not mental health, it's not addictions, it's not any of those things, it's a previous experience of homelessness. So how do we make sure we're investing upstream so no one ever becomes homeless? How do we balance the immediate needs that we currently see as well? And then how do we support folks to transition into permanent supportive housing? If you also look at our funding slide, you look at housing assistance there, that is exactly focused on prevention and diversion. So how do we support folks to get last month's rent, first month's rent, uh, arrears, some sort of immediate prevention supports. Lots of our agencies, the Housing Resource Center does a lot of work around some of those pieces. Um, but we also recognize that again, more than 50% of our by name party list has been homeless for at least six months or more. So. The struggle with our system is how do we balance all of those three different things, our inflow into homelessness, the current immediate crisis, and also how do we build up our outflow so that there's exits for folks to go to. As my late grandfather would say, that was clear as mud for a layman like me, but I understand where you're going with that. Um, I wonder, Mr. Chair, if I, I've actually got five questions. I said three, I'm sorry. What's the status of the Trinity group where we had the de facto warming room? What is the current status of that organization? Through you, I actually can't give an honest answer. I, I don't know. I know Stopgap is not operating anymore, but in terms of their ongoing plans, I'm not sure. I think that that's part of this community consultation and part of the, the concept that we've provided here is what lessons can we learn from them and what potential opportunities are there moving forward? Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, if we are going to go ahead with the plan as described in theory, in big picture terms, um, I was asked today, if council um, provided support for the plan and you're going to put modular homes of different configurations uh, on the site. Will there be tents allowed on that location as well? Could you speak to that? Or could someone speak to that potentially? Commissioner? And how will we, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. That, that's certainly something that as we've discussed this already with at the level that we have, and clearly it's the, the, one of the themes has been we haven't got to the level of detail on, on much of the of the planning here, but certainly our discussions with the community groups that would you know, providing homeless services in the community and our own expectations are that the reason this is being put in front of council is that this has an opportunity to um, deal with the homelessness and the tenting on that site in a better way. And that if we're providing these number of units to meet the demand, there would be an expectation that there would be no tolerance for tenting on that site because the city is now meeting the expectation of demand for a better alternative on the site. And uh, that's certainly the parameters by which staff have gone into this plan and the expectation around the tenting element on that site that if this enhanced level of service with better supports and better type of housing is being provided that the expectation be that um, tenting not be permitted or tolerated on the site from a community perspective recognizing that you know that that's why there's going to be all many forms of housing some may be single units some may be quadplexes some may be connected units some may be dorm style to try to meet the expectations and the preferences and the needs of people that are currently tenting there in a better way on the site. So Mr. Chair, thank you for the responses, Mr. Lehman and, and uh, our presenters. Would you mind putting me back on the list? I, I've, I've got a few more questions, but I, I don't want to monopolize the time. Thank you. Yep, for sure. All right, so questions, Councillor Hakey, Mayor Leal, Crowley, Burke, Duguay, Arnell, Baldwin. Councillor Hakey, questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And Thank you for the report. It's um, no matter which side you're on, 
it's very valuable information. And I wanted to say, I, I think, if you'll allow me, the end result, I don't care which side you're on, I think we all want the same thing. We want people to be housed, to be safe. How we approach it, I think, is going to be different. But I wanted to say that at first. I do have some questions, Mr. Chair, uh, through you. First of all, um, will this be a low or no barrier shelter? And I don't know to who. Through the chair, that's a that's a difficult question to answer. Um, purpose of going of looking at a different type of model is that in a congregate model, um, you're managing uh, a lot of higher levels of behavior that are triggered by other folks that are in the space with you. Um, one of the reasons why we're looking at this modular approach where people have a door that they can close is that they can have space to themselves and not be impacting the folks around them in the same way. So um, we still have a lot of details to work out, but we would be looking at um, trying to provide something that isn't currently provided well in the system as it exists. So we're hoping that the end result can be that people um, don't feel that they are um, restricted in the same way that they, they may be in the sh current shelter system. And we do under recognize that the current shelter system does present barriers to folks to access it. And that's one of the reasons why they're not accessing it at this time. Okay, thank you very much. And Mr. Chair, through you, I'm gonna extend that question a bit more then. Um, so an individual has a unit there, will that individual be able to use drugs or alcohol in that location? In their own unit? Through the chair, we wouldn't be. It, oh, okay, okay. We. Uh... We'll, we'll see what we can do on that. So just everyone around the table, including myself, if we can just speak up as best we can. So Councillor Hakey, if you can just ask the question again and, and then we'll get a response and we're, so, we'll look into that, everyone. Okay, thank you. To repeat uh, the question is, then if an individual is housed in their unit, will they be allowed to use drugs or alcohol? Through the chair, um, Housing First does use a harm reduction approach, which means that we are trying to reduce the risks for folks who are going to engage in risky activities. Um, and I, I'm not sure that I can go further than that without really under, like, without having the full plan. Like this is, these are the, some of the tough conversations that we're going to need to have as we create the plan to, um, to set up these, these units. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. How many individuals to date has the city moved from homelessness to being housed or some tran uh, transitional housing? It, it, give me in five years, if you can, two and one. Off the top of your head. For your chair, off the very top of my head, um, uh, I know that we've had anywhere between two to 300 shifts or instances of someone moving from homelessness to housed. I will acknowledge that again, it's not a linear transition for folks. So for some folks, it might require a different unit type. So someone might move into a congregate living unit and it's not successful for them. So they might enter back into homelessness. Um, so again, I, that's off the very top of my head um, in the last two years. It might even be a year, but I can provide that information at a later date that's more specific. Thank you. For me, it would be important. Uh, thank you very much. So on the housing, going on the housing first model again, Mr. Chair, through you, uh, my preference is that I want to live in a tent, even though we've erected the modular housing. What do we do? Certainly, I think, as we've discussed today, those are difficult questions that we're going to have to deal with the operator of the facility. We're anticipating that the site would be fenced. So it wouldn't be out of reason that 
if, if someone's particular circumstance was beneficial for them to tent within that facility rather than take a unit, it may be beneficial for that person. So I don't want to, we don't as staff want to say that we would 100% preclude it within the facility itself, within the site itself, but our expectation would be that um, we're precluding tenting outside the site. Okay, thank you. And my last question for now, <clears throat> excuse me if I can. Um, with the build that we're doing on Monaghan Road and we're asking for CMHC funding uh, of 100%, um, if that comes back and they're not giving us that, and I, I seem to recall a number and I'll throw it out with it, it might be adjusted as 7 million. With this money that we're potentially using here, could that be used for that build or vice versa? Through you, Chair, Mr. Chair, as long as it met the criteria, which I believe Ms. Morgan Quinn read out at the beginning, which I'm not going to be able to quote off the top of my head, but as long as it goes towards the diverting homelessness and working with homeless persons, it would be eligible, certainly. And uh, we would have to determine what level of supports and other things to comply with the expectations, but it would be an eligible expense. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, Hakey. Uh, questions, Mayor Leal? Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chair, um, through you uh, uh, to the team here. First of all, on the onset, I want to really compliment, uh, just follow for Councillor Hakey. Uh, this report is a cabinet quality report. Um, so that is, uh, that's a real testament to Mr. Lehman, yourself, both of you there, and the two councillors, uh, uh, Burke and Rial, that were involved in this. Um, exceptional, it really is exceptional. So. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll start with that. My first question to you, Mr. Chair, how many, uh, how many people uh, that currently uh, are um, utilizing uh, the Wall Street shelter are either on ODSP or OW? Through you, Mr. Chair, again, off the very, very top of my head, I would say at least 75%. The exception, 75%. again, is individuals who are um, uh, older who are receiving CPP and OAS, but it's a significant portion. And through you, Mr. Hirsch, just to reiterate what's your report, because I think this is important for the public, because if we go to modular homes, uh, the city of Peterborough can obtain the shelter allowance both on an OW and ODSP. Is that correct? Through you, Mr. Chair, yes, that's correct. My next question um, resolves around housing first. The challenge we have in Peterborough, why we can't pursue housing first as vigorously as we like to, because we have a vacancy rate of 1.1%. Plus we had the uh, some additional uh, housing pressures uh, brought about and we welcome them, students at Fleming, students at Trent. So that our real problem is we need to build, build and build some more in terms of moving, moving through people through the system. And until we can get that building accomplished, we can't really implement the full scope of Housing First. Uh, through the chair, that's correct. Um, one of the items that I, I was looking at as we were applying for this um, funding through CMHC is that Peterborough has the fourth lowest, so we have the lowest vacancy rate in Ontario the fourth lowest vacancy Canada. rate in Canada. in Canada. So all three of the cities ahead of us on that not very good list um, with lower vacancy rates actually got allocations through the Rapid Housing Initiative program, which means they didn't have to compete with all the other communities in the, in the country who are trying to access the funding. So um, there's a lack of recognition of the need here and there's a lack of um, Real uh, our provincial funding year over year has decreased for builds of the kind that we could leverage to create permanent supportive housing, and the increase, as you are fully aware, have only increased. Um, we're looking at higher costs per unit than we've ever had before, um, and we are only getting enough in our annual allocation under the Ontario Priorities Housing Initiative to do a couple of units, and that's. It's, it's not going to be enough. If I continue, Mr. Chair, then, Ms. Quinn, what you're telling me is, on a national basis, um, St. Peter is being shortchanged. 
Uh, Sorry the, to put you on the spot. Uh, but. Through the chair, I um, I do feel like Peterborough could have been one of the um, the communities that was that was receiving an allocation, or that our our level of need should be recognized. I do think, though, I'll add that the homelessness prevention program we don't have full transparency on what the allocations that were received by other communities were. But just in conversation with some of my service manager colleagues, it does seem as though um, as a proportion on top of our original allocation that we did get a higher um, percentage. So I hope that that's a sign of things to come. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Chair, if I continue, my next question is for Mr. Lehman. Mr. Lehman, if we move forward with this plan, there has to be a reasonable expectation that city bureau bylaws will be enforced. Is that a reasonable expectation? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. A community expectation. Yeah, there, there is nothing proposed in our in our report that changes the approach of the parks bylaw and enforcement and expectations around tenting in in the in in the, in our parks and open spaces. Certainly, our, our expectation and hope is that this provides another forum to address the need, so that we can see reduced tenting um, and the demand for reduced tenting already. But nothing is changing our enforcement approach or the expectation of enforcement. Mr. Chair, just before I conclude, I think Councillor Rial will has moved something. I know we still have questions. It certainly be my intent to move a number L, which would be the establishment of a community liaison committee at the city of police would be a member of and one of the ward councillors, but I can talk uh, more about that when we get to the discussion. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Mayor Leal. Councillor Crowley, questions? Uh, yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I think my first question is going to be for um, Commissioner Reyna. Um, just out of curiosity, does this solution uh, align with the official plan, Central Area Master Plan, uh, and or the City Strategic Plan, or does this fall outside that because it's sort of an emergency situation? Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good question. Thank uh, you. Definitely, it aligns with the strategic plan. Uh, but I still have to, uh, like, when we see the whole plan unfold, and then we will see where does it align. I see. Yep. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so I guess the another question that I have through you, Mr. Chair, we are getting, or the city's getting $2.5 million a year over the next three years, and I'm assuming that funding is should this report be approved, it's going towards operational and capital builds, I guess, building both or building the modular homes and then operating them. Um, what happens year four and then year five? I mean, what's the, would the expectation be, I mean, I guess the capital build would then sort of wind down once we build, I guess, enough modular homes, depending on how many units they have per, by the way, I don't think we know yet. We don't have a plan yet or anything. So, the, the, I guess we have really no idea yet what the cost would be sort of year four, year five. It would just probably be sort of operational, I would presume. And do, we don't really have a number or anything like that yet. If I could, Mr. Chair, uh, to answer uh, Councillor Crowley's question, that is always a risk with these, with these right. provincial programs are usually even our existing allocation is in three-year increments. Mm -hmm. So that is a drawback to this, that it's hard to plan beyond the three-year increments all the time. We saw that with social service relief funding during the pandemic, mm -hmm. which is why council was faced with funding Wolf Street on its own uh, a number of months ago, Wolf Street Overflow Shelter. So that's always a risk. Um, but I think we do see a sustainability of this because the up the initial capital cost to purchase the modular units and such would be in year one. Right. So the, presumably the demand for the purchase of the units wouldn't be as great in years two and three. So they could focus more on the sustainability of the operations to, to bring it into a stable amount for future funding. I see, okay, thank you. Um, so in terms of, um, site security. I mean, again, I know that this is really high level stuff and we haven't actually come up with a solution, but, uh, and obviously any solution that we come up with is going to include uh, the people that live in Dalhousie and potentially people who are on Aylmer and, and uh, 
George Street as well. But um, would there be some sort of obvious 24-7 site security along with fencing? Would we have any sort of perimeter security to ensure that, you know, if we have security on site in this, uh, in this facility, I guess, you know, there's nothing to say that people won't be outside, potentially, devil's advocate, you know, messing around on, on Dalhousie. Would there be the potential to have security sort of around the perimeter as well as not just inside, just to make sure that everybody feels as safe? I mean, obviously, security is meant for the people on site to be safe. But as well, it would be another opportunity to make sure that the people who are living on Dalhousie are just as safe, I would presume, so, or have that feeling of, of, of safety. Or is this, are, are we just, we're just talking high level now, that could happen at some point? Uh, through the chair, I, I do think that we are talking high level, but we do recognize that security will be an important piece of this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the, our plan is to, through consultation with the neighborhood, understand what the needs would be and how it can be provided in such a way that it enhances the feeling of safety in that area. Mm -hmm. um, we are, this is new for us, but there are other communities that are approaching this um, similar ideas. So I think we would probably also see what's working in other areas. Okay, excellent. Um, just my, my last sort of comment before I shut up is uh, uh, I do actually think that, that having, having them either be all low barrier or potentially one or two or whatever be low barrier, I think that might be a really great idea just because if that's what's preventing people from getting out of a tent and into shelter, I think that, that that's probably a really valuable thing in my opinion. So that's all I got to say. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Crowley. Councillor Burke, questions? Uh, yeah, thanks. One question through you, Chair Beamer. Um, I just want to, first of all, just lead by saying thank you to Sheldon and Rebecca and Jocelyn. It's been amazing to work with you and, and Keith for, for sort of taking me under your wing. Um, you know, this report was so thorough. This is not an idea that was written on the back of a napkin. This is not someone's opinion. This is a really well thought through plan for the crisis that we're in. Um, you know, the whole idea of us using portables is the fact that they are portable, right? So I think just by nature, we're acknowledging that this is not going to be forever. This is, a, this is a, a reaction to a situation that has gotten out of hand. So my question um, is that if we don't do this, if this doesn't pass, right, we have no structure at Wolf Street. We have between 50 to 60 people camping. We have an overflow shelter staffed by two people. We've heard that one roof is shutting down. It's springtime and we're, hearing, we're seeing people set up more so now than they were last summer. How do you foresee our homelessness crisis escalating if we don't do this? Uh, through the chair, I don't have a crystal ball, but we have seen um, encampments in the past and we have um, seen what can happen. And escalation of encampments has led to some so people being at very high risk. It's not a safe place for anyone to be. Um, and we don't, um, that's not the future that we want to plan towards. We know that we can't put these pieces in place quickly enough to prevent encampment from happening um, in the short term. But um, we, we know that if a different approach we are hopeful that a different approach could lead, reduce the risk for both the people who are living there and the people in the neighborhood around. Thank you. And um, so you kind of you kind of spoke to it at the end, but um, alternatively, if we do if we do pass this concept and start to enact what what's being suggested, what are some of the tangible benefits that we can expect to see differences than what we're experiencing right now? Through the chair, one of the pieces in the plan that we haven't really touched on, but is definitely something we hear from neighbors is a lack of facilities for people. And so if we can create a place like, if people are concerned with using uh, someone's front yard as their washroom, 
then providing a washroom could be a major step up. If people are concerned with shopping carts going missing and wandering all over the city and they don't want to see that, if people have a place that they can be and they can store their things, they don't have to ha carry it with them everywhere. They're not carrying it with them because they want to. They're carrying it with them because they're afraid that someone will steal it while they're away. So I think that it will, um, it will improve the feeling in that neighborhood. It will also, I think, alleviate some of the concerns that people have downtown. Um, people will be able to stabilize themselves and have a place to rest. I think a lot of these folks, like when we see people who have been homeless for four years, it takes a long time to bounce back from that. And this is going to be that first step. So it's, I think, really understanding it um, from the folks that we're trying to serve, that's really important, but also for the neighbors in, in the area. Um, and we're really hopeful that neighborhood engagement could turn the conversation to a different direction, that um, there could be better integration. Thanks, and then um, lastly, um, my last question, Chair Beamer, through you um, to Rebecca or Jocelyn or Sheldon. Um, I think one of the really great things that I witnessed was the meeting that we had um, subsequent to this with all of the agencies. And one of the beautiful things about the report is that the city really picks a lane, right? For a long time, we've been sort of scattered in our approach. And this is a very focused report where we're picking a lane. Um, and in doing so, we need support of the homelessness serving agencies in the community that offer all of those supports you said that were necessary. That's not really for us to do. Um, can you please speak to what I witnessed as unanimous support, what I witnessed as agencies in the city being really positive about this um, and, and willing to work with the city um, and, and thinking that this was going to be a successful response and better and, and unanimously thinking that this was going to be better than what's happening right now? Through you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, in that meeting, it was incredible to see, again, the list of agencies who were included in the report. And again, I also want to acknowledge Peterborough Public Health, who has also voiced their support for this initiative, coming together um, and all uh, unanimously agreeing that this was a, a, an option where we might see a different result, specifically, again, for the most complex individuals in the community. Again, when we go to that spectrum, there is a gap in our system where, where the needs of those individuals aren't being met. Um, I can't express how unwell clients are. Again, uh, Rebecca and I worked at the uh, overflow kind of space at Christmas at social services, and it's I can't explain and describe how unwell folks are. Um, and I think that this, in collaboration with um, really amazing community partners who do hard work every day, is an option forward. Uh, to meet the needs of those individuals and some agencies have already stepped forward and said that they'll provide supports or redirect supports to this initiative because it's something that they believe in. Thank you for that. Thank you, Councillor Burke. Qu questions, Councillor DeGay? Thank you, Chair Beamer. Uh, Rebecca and Jocelyn, I want to start off by thanking you for your attendance over the Christmas holidays um, um uh, Simcoe Street and your service in that regard it didn't go unnoticed by some of us around this table I have four questions if I might I'm not sure who's going to be responding to the questions on page eight of your of the staff report there's reference made to um, mid mid page it says it is not expected that 267,000 will be sufficient to fund such a 24 seven service. So the recommendations in this report identify the usage of the increased homelessness prevention program to augment. So that I'm the one roof program. So one roof, which currently a tenant at a, at a uh, place of worship in our downtown of which we're not party to that lease agreement, the city is per se, is the intention. So I'm clear the intention that one roof its program or equivalent will be housed in the hub in the Wall Street building. For you, Mr. Chair, I think that's part of the conversation. That's the next pieces that we need to have. I think there's some recognition that we do need to provide some sort of meal program for the individuals who will be living in these units as they won't have kitchens or access to food. So I think there is some uh, consideration to that. But what that will actually look like is part of the consultation that we need to have with community partners moving forward. 
in that regard, supplementary, then is the estimated budget, does it make provision for necessary improvements to Wall Street to create what would be the equivalent of a commercial kitchen? Through you, Mr. Chair, I think there's some recognition that the budget is going to need some significant compromises um, to make sure that we can meet the needs or as many of the needs as possible. I think that if there is a community meal program in a different avenue, that might support, then maybe we won't need to retrofit the kitchen. I do know that there is some sort of a kitchen facility there, but again, we didn't go too farther down the road in terms of these conversations um, because we're not sure what that's going to look like. Um, so we'll have to see kind of what happens next. Thank you. I have a second uh, question um, specific, I might, um, uh, Chair Beamer, to Commissioner Laidman. Commissioner Laidman, you referenced the operator of the facility and you said you weren't certain i believe you said you weren't certain who would that be is that not going to be the city of peterborough being the operator or can you like confirm for our benefit who would be the operator of the facility yeah thanks uh through uh you mr mr chair city of peterborough doesn't operate any of the homeless services we're a service arranger a service funder a service provider of a, of a, a manager of a system so our intent would that the city would not be operating the service, that there's more um, strategically and financially, it's better off if a, if a third party uh, provides the service. They're set up to do it more quickly, uh, more cost effectively, and uh, presumably have the skills to do it. So that would be one of the top priorities is to work with our partners to figure out who would be best served to operate it through an agreement that we're overseeing to make sure there's some basic tenants, objectives, parameters, um, oversight. That's our role, is, but not to be providing the direct service. Thank you. Um, I have a question then generally of staff. Were private lands, privately owned lands within the central area considered as part of your uh, facility location in lieu of uh, maintaining the current Wolf Street location? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair, D definitely. Uh, we had many conversations about that. And I think one of the provisions in the report is to look at those alternative sites over time to see if, if they could be better set up to um, diffuse Wolf Street. But at the present time, this is a site that the city has, has ownership of and the ability based on its topography and, and situation is easily set up. If we were going to go to a landowner, we would have to make sure we had agreements and various other things that can take time. But we are definitely interested in pursuing those options to see if there's better locations over time. Maybe it's four units on a property. You know, it's less obtrusive. And if you can have five of those sites, maybe it's a less obtrusive model going forward. I have one final question, Chair Beamer. Thank you. This is to Mr. Appleby. I don't mean to always put you on the spot, Mr. Appleby, but could a community organization or its equivalent, could they initiate an MZO to permit the use on this property or elsewhere in our central area? Um, through the chair, yes, they could. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Questions, Councillor Purnell. Uh, who's that? Oh, Baldwin. Sorry, Baldwin. And then Lachika. Councillor Purnell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, do we know why St. John's is not renewing their contract with us to be uh, the one roof food service? Um, the the man uh, through you, Mr. Chair. The manager who oversees that program is not here tonight. Then uh, those discussions. But from my understanding, it's a difficult program to operate. It takes a fair amount of resources, staff, and volunteer time. It's been increasingly difficult to get volunteers, especially since of the pandemic. And there's some fatigue involved in providing that difficult service for a congregation, uh, for a religious con congregation. And um, all those factors have aligned that um, 
they informed us uh, that they didn't want to continue after 2023. Yeah, they've, they've had enough. Um, can you please tell me all what is going to go into the Wolf Street building? We've talked a little bit about a commercial kitchen, yes or no, but uh, we'll have to add more showers, laundry. You've talked about office and storage, um, but what is going to go into that building? Um, and uh, will it also operate um, as the replacement for one roof, and will it also operate as a replacement or continue as the overflow shelter? Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, in terms of the actual Wolf Street building, um, I, again, part of the conversation is the next steps, but initially, or sorry, if the modular units um, go in, at the Wolf Street site, uh, again, looking at our funding, we might need to utilize our overflow funding in a different way. So overflow would no longer be there. The funding would be utilized to, to support the, the concept that's being presented tonight. In terms of the actual building itself, I'm not sure if we'll need a commercial kitchen. I think the bathrooms and showers, part of the conversation is potentially actually having portable or semi-permanent kind of structures that you might see at a festival or something to that degree outside and not so we don't have to spend additional money um, at the actual building. But again, it will come down to, to costs and what those sorts of things look like. The structure itself on the top floor, there are currently office building uh, office offices that aren't being utilized. So that could be an access space again for outreach agencies to meet with clients or clients to meet with outreach agencies. Okay, thank you. Um, and what exact if we're allowing drugs and alcohol in here as a low barrier, no barrier um, modular community, what is security expected to do? For you, Mr. Chair, I think that um, that comes down to the conversations in terms of expectations. I think that there's expectations in all of our supportive housing programs. A lot of them, actually, I shouldn't say that, all of them are housing first focused and all of them practice harm reduction policies. And so how do we support individuals to have the support and items that they may require to be safe? Um, but I think that the modular units will likely follow the same principles. I think it's again, how do we support individuals to feel safe? Um, and how do we support the staff and the agencies uh, to support individuals through whatever their recovery process might look like? But if we're allowing drugs and alcohol in this area, in, within the modular units, how is that making the, the people who are trying to get away from of uh, this lifestyle, how does that? How do they feel safe, and how does the how do the the neighbors feel safe? So I, I can through you, Mr. Chair. I can speak to the individuals who might uh, not want to be in that environment, but who might be experiencing homelessness. I think that there might be some other potential options for us to to explore. I think. If you go to the Wolf Street encampment right now, there are individuals where they have kind of segregated themselves, to be honest, based on the individuals that they surround themselves with. So again, to uh, Commissioner Laidman's point, is there an opportunity for us to explore other options for those particular individuals that might not be at Wolf Street? Or are those the individuals who might be better connected to access shelter? And what is the barrier for them to access shelter? I think that there's a wide variety of different individuals um, who are experiencing homelessness who have different needs and how do we, uh, as a system, balance those, those priorities. And is part of the plan um, to actually have a, a security, a, a wooden um, privacy fence uh, between this and the, the neighbors and, and the Chamber of Commerce and George Street and Tim Hortons and the Holiday Inn and the thousands of people who go to Music Fest? Through you, Mr. Chair, that's definitely been part of the conversation is how do we support the individuals to, to feel safe in that space, but then also how do we support the surrounding neighborhood as well? And so those are parts of the conversations, but we have had those conversations. But what are the answers? How are we going to make the neighbors feel safe? And that question would be relevant, whether it's at Wolf Street or any other location in the city. I could, Mr. Chair. I, 
I don't think we're going to be able to satisfy council tonight with all those answers. And I know those are our questions that are very important to the success of this. And those are weighing on our minds as staff as well. Um, but I, at least for the, for the fencing issue, every discussion has, 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 has been predicated on the assumption that there would need to be some uh, fencing to differentiate the site. And that's the expectation, both from outside as well as within. That's always been a, a main objective or understanding. Okay, but um, <clears throat> thank you. But Mr. Chair, I don't think I really got the answer I wanted uh, on what security is expected to do. So if we're fencing this area and there's gonna be a gate in and out, um, is security going to be uh, asking them, you know, do you, Okay, no weapons allowed like we do now with our shelters and oh yeah, but you can take drugs and alcohol in. I mean, what is security going to actually do for the community within this um, encampment as well as for the neighborhood outside? Through the chair, I realize that this is not a satisfying answer, but we don't have that answer at this time. We are working towards it. We are, we, we haven't planned because we don't have approval of the concept. Um, and this is intended to bring a concept to council to move forward on. Um, and we don't have all of the pieces in place yet. Um, and I realize that that's not a final answer, but that's where we are in the stage of planning right now. Okay, um, one additional question. We know we have been allocated some additional provincial monies, which we are grateful for. Um, but there's no costing in this report. We don't know what the costs of the operational piece is or how many units we can buy for the money because we don't know where we're buying them from yet. Um, and then if we plan for the 60 or 70 people we have currently, what do we do with the other ones who arrive now that we've provided additional housing and services? Mr. Freeman? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, there's just a lot of questions that we don't have fulsome answers on here this evening. And we're hearing the discussion and, and we are going to take them away. We'll come, you know, we're putting a plan together. We we have these questions as well. And, and we'll make sure that there's appropriate uh, solutions in place to move forward and using the funds in the most efficient and effective way to meet the goals that we're talking about here this evening. This is really about making sure that council's buying into the direction, the concept, and the plan, kind of the, the, the lane that I've heard this evening, putting ourselves in to move forward to resolve a crisis here in that neighborhood. And we see this as a, an effective way to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Freeman, Commissioner Freeman. Uh, Councillor Parnell. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, I'm just concerned that when we had Tent City uh, back um, across the street, um, they they did set up certain areas amongst themselves as to you know what their personal preference was um, of the type essentially the type of uh, community drugs that they used etc. And it was not a safe environment. It was an enabling, very dangerous environment for everyone. And hearing what the you know with the no barrier, low barrier, lack of security rules, we're just going to be putting that. That, that very same problem but within a fenced area and modular homes um, that would house maybe four people per unit or something. Um, so I, I don't see how this is a safe community for the people that we really, we want to help, but it, it is a, a very complex, difficult issue. And I don't see how it's going to help any neighborhood where this would go okay. either. It, thank you. No, thank you. And I'll put, put you on the list for discussion as well. So good points. Thank you. Now, so questions, I have Councillor Baldwin, Lachika, Mayor Leal, and then maybe we can move into debate. We can still ask questions in debate, of course, but um, so uh, Councillor Baldwin, uh, questions, please. I'll try and be re no, brief. No, no, take your chair. Take your time. Given what um, take your time. our acting CEO has, has said, and I think it was good advice, uh, Mr. Freeman. Um, Rebecca, um, we've all heard there is a potential uh, other um, location with the Habitat for Humanity purchase and the PATH group. Um, my question is, um, 
are tiny homes anticipated going into the Wall Street property in addition to the modular homes? Has that come to your group? Through the chair, we have looked at multiple options, understanding that um, there are various needs and trying to understand whether providing um, different types, different housing types might be helpful, um, whether they have different purposes. Um, we're, this is all in the early planning, but we are we would look at costing out the um, more like dorm style modular modular units as well as the tiny homes type units. We know that there are some individuals for whom that tiny home style might be very effective. Um, there, but there are some folks who um, will need to not have the same. Um, requirement, whether that's paying rent or whatever it is, that they they need something that's more easily accessed um, for whatever reason. So we are looking at m multiple different forms um, for the site. Okay, thanks for that. And, and Mr. Chair, my last question is, I'm just doing some elementary math here, $2.4 million, we'll use that figure, a thousand dollars a month rent times 12 months would be twelve thousand dollars but if I take that figure and I divide that into 2.4 million dollars that's potentially housing 200 people if those facilities of permanent nature would be there and so you can play with the numbers I just used 200 people could be housed every year if I use the the assumptions I just did thousand dollars a month rent 12 12 months 1200 $12,000. However, um, A, they're probably not available in Peterborough, the housing that we need to put those 200 people in. And you've also spoken about the, acu the acuity of these people. So if we had such a, an arrangement where the private sector would build some of those things for us, some of those units for us, we'd still have to have support systems on site. Have I got that correct? Would that, would that be your, Through your the recommendation? Chair, yes, that would be our recommendation. It, it, it wouldn't work. Housing first is not housing only. Right. It needs to be accompanied by supports. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Baldwin. We'll have Councillor Lachika, Mayor Leal, and then we'll get into debate. Councillor Lachika, questions? Thank you. Uh, through you, Chair, to, um, to our presenters today, um, I just wanted to say uh, that the presentation was really prolific. And back in the fall when we had asked for a report on Housing First, because that's what the city had espoused as, as the approach, you know, not only have you shared how far we've come, you've shared the template for the whole community and for council and for the city of Peterborough to know that there is strategy, there is a plan and there is a commitment to addressing homelessness, which which is a crisis. And that crisis is not one that we we bear on our own. It's something that we share with cities across this country and across this globe. And uh, we're not alone. And, and thank you for the team, Councillor Riel and Councillor Burke, and the agencies and all the time spent together to make this presentation happen. Um, it's just so much and, and it's really incredible and, and you've shared it so well. Um, you, you mentioned, um, Ms. Blasey, that you spent time at the AMO conference and my question is around that. Did you find that the e efficacy of addressing homelessness and housing reflects what you've presented? And, and if so, uh, what's one or two takeaways that you have from looking at best practices in other cities? Because we have to remember that best practices um, need to be assessed and that we need to be talking together with our sister cities, with, with our sister communities to apply what's working. So if I could just ask that question. Thank you so much. Through you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I think at the, the AMO Symposium in particular, I think a lot of communities are heading this way. I think to your point, um, communities across Canada are seeing an increase in visible homelessness. They're seeing an increase in the number of folks who are high acuity, high needs, and the need for permanent supportive housing. Um, and 
the lack of housing, to be perfectly honest. And so I think that at the symposium, there were lots of conversations about the intersections of health, of income, of capital builds, of private development, of social housing, and how can we incorporate that. Housing First was at the forefront of almost every conversation, as well as recognizing that we need to meet individuals where they're at, and also the changing nature of homelessness. I've been in this work for not very long, um, but in that short time frame, the change in the nature of homelessness is drastic. It, to be honest, it's a 50 year span, if not a hundred year span that we've seen in the last three years, specifically because of the nature of the pandemic and the gaps that that has highlighted. And homelessness is the catch all. It is a system that can't walk away and it is where it collects all the individuals where all the other systems fail. And I think to that point, there were lots of conversations, particularly around Waterloo, who is also embarking on something very similar right now, and also the community of London and how they're looking at how they can strategically plan for this immediate crisis that is happening while also planning long term so that in five years from now, you have housing. It's not in five years from now, we're just putting shovels into the ground. What are the connections we can make with health so that we have the supports available? Um, at the same time so that those buildings are ready and we can be able to move individuals into, into housing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Chica. Mayor Leal, and then we'll move into discussion. Question? Thanks very much, Mr. Chair. Just a question. I, I've looked at uh, Waterloo, London and Kitchener and Seattle, Washington. Uh, one of the things uh, that struck me in, in Kitchener, Ontario, uh, where they've uh, brought together a number of sleeping cabins, dining homes, whatever, uh, whatever you want to characterize them. But the security was such that people that are were living inside in the tiny home sleeping cabins all had coats. So that was the only way you could get in. So the people that are delivering alcohol and drugs and that could never get into that compound, and it was enforced. That's my understanding. Is that correct? Through you, Mr. Chair, as far as I'm aware, yes, I think that there's lots of different models um, that have been explored. Again, looking at how we can support the community who's in that space so that they also feel safe. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary Leal. Ms. Morgan Quinn, Ms. Blasey, thank you so much for your presentation and uh, in all the questions, really appreciate it. Thank you. So we'll move to debate where we can still ask questions, but more debate. So uh, Councillor Riel and Bert, Councillor Riel. To the chair, certainly I will move the report. Um, there are some people in the audience tonight that I'd like to apologize first. Um, I've been, um, I've come down with a cold for about a week and certainly I know you reached out to me in emails and phone calls on having them back to you, uh, but I'm trying to do the best I can. I have two things uh, important tonight and this is housing and homeless and the transit I am chair of. We're in a crisis. People is no different, Peterborough is no different than any other city in Canada or around the world trying to grapple with housing and homeless problem. Each one of us on council heard it loud and clear from the constituents when we were campaigning for election to council. Clean up the downtown and do something about housing and homeless um, we are facing. With an unemployment rate of 5.5%, a 1.5 vacancy rate and an eroding tax base we are finding it extremely difficult to grapple with the problem of housing and homeless. Again, we are no different than any other city across Canada trying to deal and find a solution to housing and homelessness. It is very expensive to build RGI rent geared income housing, but we are trying to build as much of this as we can possibly do with the monies we have available. This brings us to the report that it's up to you to consider tonight. Where do we house the unhoused and people living in tents? Wolf Street is a city-owned property that is uh, centrally located with the, shrink, with the striking distance in the downtown for some of the amenities, people living in tents. Wolf Street uh, will be supplying, um, or the needs for the people that are living on uh, Wolf Street, food, social services, the stores to buy supplies they need to live. We do not, um, we do not, uh, wherever we put people, we are running into nimbyism, not in my backyard. I, as chair of housing and homelessness, I would like to personally apologize to the residents of Wolf, Elmer, and Dalhousie for what has unfolded in your neighborhood. To allow this type of Wild West show to continue is unacceptable. The plan we are proposing is that the area will be completely fenced off 
nobody that does not have business on the property will not be allowed. We will be bringing in uh, modular home units on a temporary basis. I know you will say that's what you told us about the warming and the warming slash shelter that it would only be temporary. Until we can find and build enough RGA housing, we need to play, uh, need a place to house people that are deemed uh, are homeless. Porta potties were brought in on an interim basis to help people um, that are in the need to stop them from defecating on people's property. We will have 724 security when this plan rolls out and our member uh, agencies that will be providing wraparound service, they have endorsed this concept. As we move along with this plan, Wolf Street uh, building will be retrofitted with washroom, showers, laundry service, and meal service. Lockers will be supplied for the occupants to safely store and secure their, um, uh, in a secure location. The idea, the idea is that shopping carts that you see in the downtown will disappear. One of the key to this plan is a neighborhood meeting to discuss, listen, learn uh, about their concerns. Someone will say, why didn't you do this happen first until we get a buy-in? Um, this is just a concept from city council. The plan was just a concept at that time. I would like to thank city staff, member of agencies, my co-chair, Councillor uh, Burke, for all of the work that they've gone into the housing, the unhoused and the marginalized. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Councillor L. So, Councillor L, you're comfortable moving for recommendations, just? Yep, okay. So speak, speaking to uh, the recommendations that have been moved, Councillor Burke and Mayor Leal. Councillor Burke. Um, thanks through the chair to my council colleagues and staff and people in the room. Um, I'm just gonna speak from the heart because this is an issue that I've been involved with um, ever since I got elected to council. And what we are proposing tonight is not a slapstick plan, but it's an emergency response to a situation that's out of control. And we are offering resources to a neighborhood that is drastically under-resourced. Right now, the only structure in that area are two staff that look after 32 beds in five rooms at the overflow shelter. That has now been reduced to 12 hours a day. This plan is very thorough, we just heard, and we're offering a, an immense amount of services beyond that. And, and you know, for the, for the people in the neighborhood, this is gonna make the situation down there better. I promise you that it will. One of the most, one of the most profound things and the, the, the real voices that aren't here at the table tonight are the voices of the people that are unhoused. Um, there was a lot of unanswered questions by staff when they were presenting this concept. And I actually think that that's a really good thing because once the concept is approved, you know, it's not gonna be us that are deciding what types of portables here and there or campers or trailers are gonna be used. Um, we're going to be working with people that are actually going to be living in them to determine their needs. There's people that are couples that can't access our shelter system. Um, and so therefore, we're going to get a sense of what people need and build them a community with some autonomy that's going to work for them for the time being while we work at that mid-range plan. Um, I think the, one of the most profound moments of, of working on all this was when we had all of the executive level staff from the agencies that were on the list were around the table and they were hearing the plan and out of their voices was that this, this is way better than what's currently happening now. This is a good thing. And there was some discussion about whether or not people that were camping were actually gonna accept this type of shelter um, because that was one of the big unknowns, right? Can we move people into, the, into these types of units? And we had the executive level directors kind of scratching their heads and we had one worker who was at the meeting who does outreach and she knows everyone by name at the encampment because it's part of her job to support that encampment. And she looked around at all of us and, and was kind of flabbergasted and looked at the screen and said, every single person down there will take this compared to how they're living right now, right? There's a lot of unknowns right now, but I tell you right now, I'm telling you that this is better than what we are currently doing. And without this, we do, we do not have a plan. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Burke. Uh, Mayor Leal. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and to uh, Councillor Leal, if I could add, uh, I believe this would be a friendly amendment. This would be number L, uh, that we have the establishment of a neighborhood liaison committee uh, made up of five to seven individuals, uh, one of them being one of the town ward councillors, 
and another one being an officer from the city of Peterborough uh, Police Service. All right, so that'll be an L, so that's a part of the main motion now. Uh, Mayor Leal. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, we're sitting here May 8th, 2023. We're seeing this evening here in Peterborough five decades of a failure of a public policy called deinstitutionalization. All governments of all political stripes have been, had the hand in deinstitutionalization over this five decades where we've lost virtually all of our capacity uh, for treatment beds, both mental health and substance abuse in the province of Ontario. But I wanna certainly uh, commend the current government of Ontario, uh, Minister Tobola and our MP, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, for announcement uh, last week uh, that we're moving forward with a series of uh, treatment beds, which will start the capacity renewal uh, that every, every uh, community across Ontario needs. So we're left in a very difficult situation. What do we do? There are not many good options when it comes to individuals experiencing homelessness, but we do know one thing for sure. We need to pick a lane. We need to, to pick a lane this evening where all the social service agencies in Peterborough adhere to that lane. The era of enablers in this community are over. We're going to make a substantial investment of taxpayers' money. We can have other agencies undermining this lane, providing tents to people. Also, it's my belief uh, that the era of tenting is over. We can't allow it. We just can't allow it. And if we're making um, uh, this kind of investment, uh, the elimination of tents is an absolute must. I've looked at some of these opportunities uh, in other jurisdictions. It's also an absolute must uh, that we have the type of security, control of people getting in, control of people getting out, and get rid of the peripheral people that are involved in this tragic uh, activity of providing drugs with people. It is also our expectation, well, none, no politicians can direct police services. It is this community's expectation that bylaws will be enforced in the city of Peterborough. That is one common denominator uh, that we need to have as we move forward. Secondly, our other uh, biggest challenge that we face is while we would like to all engage in housing first, you cannot engage in housing first with a 1.1% vacancy rate. And we had an answer to our question this evening, fourth lowest in Canada, probably the tightest vacancy rate in the province of Ontario. As we deliberate on this issue this evening, Council should certainly note that as applications come forward for developing, whether it's bachelor apartments to $2 million homes, we need to improve every application to move our housing stock forward as quickly as possible to get people that are, can move through the broad contaminant housing. That's the only way as I, said at Trent University um, about three weeks ago, give me five to 600 new units in the city of Peterborough and I'll solve the homelessness problem. You really will, you can. But if, as long as we don't have that capacity, uh, we, uh, we certainly uh, cannot solve this problem. So it will be absolutely essential as we get down to the uh, detailed problem to make sure that we have 24 seven supports uh, for individuals that will be uh, in these modular homes. And more importantly, I think one of our primary goals is to do our very best to make the investment to get these individuals on a new trajectory of life. It struck me uh, when I uh, got the great privilege of being uh, mayor of Peterborough uh, that I found out that we, we don't do anything with housing supports. Um, I was involved in a volunteer organization called Employment Planning and Counseling Peterborough uh, that provide uh, uh, supports for individuals that faced barriers to employment. They have never been consulted once in terms of individuals experiencing homelessness here in Peterborough. We need to bring them into the, into the equation. Across the road, uh, we have PACE that provides uh, education uh, supports on numeracy and literacy skills. I bet if we uh, uh, did some uh, research and data digging, we'll find that numeracy and literacy skills are something many of these individuals need. 
The only way, the only way we're going to solve this problem is through a comprehensive approach. And I think the lane we're picking this evening is the best lane that we have available uh, to achieve uh, uh, to achieve success in this area. Thanks very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Mayor uh, Leal. Uh, Councillor DeGay. Thank you, Chair Beamer. Uh, Since, uh, or leading up to the municipal election and post-election, a topic that um, I think we have all grappled with is Wolf Street, the encampment. It now has a name, it, it, as a persona. It's like, it's um, like in my mind, we refer to East City, we refer to Fort Heights, we refer to the encampment. It's become something. And from my perspective, that is regrettable, that we've allowed as a municipality, as a community, we've allowed the evolution, this metamorphosis of this tenting to occur on essentially what has become on a permanent basis. This is a circumstance that if it was on private lands and it was equivalent of somebody built or did something to accommodate a number of persons without permits, without regard for municipal rules, it's illegal. It would be illegal under normal circumstances. The city would probably be caused to enforce the bylaw. But I'm also acknowledging this is, has to be one of the most unique circumstances sitting in front of council. While we were, um, while we were debating the subject in our previous present, pre presenters, Federation of Canadian Municipalities just released a homelessness encampment review program today. So they're asking municipalities. So it's becoming certainly something national. So in, in, in terms of far as my general comments and concerns, I have had Numerous phone calls, emails from neighbors and area property owners, and not a single person is happy with what is, has occurred on Wolf Street, what it, how has it impacted Dalhousie Street, Wolf Street, George Street, Elmer Street, and beyond. There hasn't been one phone call to date saying we're happy with the current proposal either. There has been expressions of concerns. I'm referring to calls that I've received and emails that I've received. You may, other, my colleagues may receive different ones. I'm speaking what I've received and entertained. Thusly, I'm concerned about whatever the outcome, if it doesn't proceed, we have to deal with it. We are gonna have to address the, the neighborhood and its, uh, their, its realities. If it does proceed, we're still gonna have to deal with the neighborhood. I am somewhat concerned that, and I appreciate this as a concept, and it brings forward an opportunity so we can do exactly what we're doing tonight, debating, asking questions of staff. But my, my take is that the neighborhood has once again not been appropriately involved. They're going to be involved after the fact. And it's a bit worrisome to me, but they could still be involved. Uh, Mayor Leal, to your point around housing and housing supply, housing supply from, I think, my, my context um, does encompass persons that are difficult are having difficulties being housed transitional housing to something more permanent it's the entire continuum our our official plans our official plan the the and other planning documents speak to it um, again so in summary um, i am concerned about the neighborhood context that we're going to be approaching the neighborhood after the fact or we're going to be approaching the neighborhood with how we're going to resolve something that's been that isn't otherwise being tolerated or should not otherwise be permitted. Um, I am also somewhat concerned that conceptually, the idea of making something permanent, supposedly potentially secure, where there's still operational construction related costs that we're uncertain of at this point. And I don't wish to sound cute, but it's kind of like a post-it note. You can put it on a piece of paper, but it's there temporarily, but temporarily permanent until you take it off. That post and note can sit on that piece of paper forever. And at present, we don't know if there will be yet an alternative solution available to uh, remove Wolf Street as a temporarily permanent uh, fixture in the Dalhousie Street neighborhood. I, those are my comments and concerns. It's not debate, but it's just trying to offer some uh, context. And I wanted to lastly clarify to the point I raised with Mr. Appleby, um, we have this evening another ministerial zoning order, which is attempting to move something through a development process in a more 
a more, a more untypical but expeditious way, conceivably the same could have potentially happened on this side or some equivalent in our community. I just leave that as a food for thought. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Councillor Duguay. Uh, Councillor Burke for a second time. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Chair Beamer, through you. Um, I think one of the most powerful, powerful things in the report is the numbers, right? And there's a lot of talk about the tenting, you know, and, and until we deal with those numbers, we're, we're always gonna have people set up. We have 302 individuals that are set up and we have about 100 or so, 107, 106 shelter beds, right? So we, we have an issue there, right? Um, we also have a history in the city of, of creating policy and creating services for unhoused people that doesn't meet their needs. One of the things we heard about was all the people that we housed this year, right? But, but like that, whatever that number was, Jocelyn, 350 or something, but that could represent one person like 16 times, right? We're taking someone who's unhoused of high acuity, meaning they have complex, complex needs attached to their housing and we're throwing them in a white box without any supports and we're expecting for them to survive. And, you know, and they might last a month, they might last three weeks, but they end up back out on the street, right? So part of this report is looking at that systemic change that we need to make, right? We're acknowledging people where they're at and we're, we're resourcing the area in a way that's gonna meet the needs of not only the people that are unhoused, but it's gonna meet the needs of the neighborhood. We're offering structure there that currently doesn't exist. And this is an emergency response. Mark my words, this will be better than what we have now. And this is definitely better than us not doing this tonight and continuing to have the situation of Wolf Street get out of hand. We have, we have tried to ship people to Highway 7 in a motel. We have had a program at the Trent Winds where we house people that failed, right? This is, this is a radically different ap approach, which is something that we need. We are meeting people where they're at. We're acknowledging that we can't do it all. So we have all these agencies on board uh, and we're gonna be nimble and quick and we're gonna do it, right? And as we're doing it, we're gonna work towards the midterm and the long-term plans. Part of this report too is also to look at how we're spending our money on homelessness, right? It's looking at all these little 20,000 and 30,000 dollar here and there money we're putting into programs that aren't meeting the acuteness of the need that we're all talking about tonight, right? So. So I don't really know what, like I might go on summer holiday if this doesn't go through, I'll kick up my feet because this is the plan, right? You put Councillor Riel and I, Councillor Riel is the oldest councillor, I'm the youngest councillor, right? Now, now, and he told me that, okay? He, I only know, I only know because he told me that. I only know because he told me that. And, and, and the idea is, is that there was an expectation for us to meet in the middle. There was an expectation for us to meet in the middle and we've done that. And we've seen the bright minds at the city work really hard and diligently on this. And this is my quote for the night. This is not a plan written on the back of a napkin, right? This is a plan with a lot of variables, but we're gonna put faith with the experts in our community to work with the city and to work with us to make sure that all those unknowns and all those variables are done with evidence-based approaches that are gonna work for people that are unhoused and people in the community. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have Councillor Baldwin, Crowley, and Lachika. Councillor Baldwin. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Deborah, Councillor Burke's um, mic again. Um, yeah, this is probably one of the most difficult things we're, we're going to grapple with. Um, and it's been ongoing for um, a number of years. The model that we currently have, we really have destroyed a neighborhood. Um, no question about it. Um, and we have to do better. You know, we really do. Um, with respect to um, Councillor Duguay's comments about consultation with the neighborhood, I, I like himself and probably most councillors, I've either had phone calls or emails about the situation. Um, our committee structure is, um, um, you know, we meet tonight, we have a week off, and then there's a, a cooling off period, if you will, or a way for people to consult and talk to us. And they can come back and do delegations uh, at City Council in two weeks. I think that's another opportunity. Um, but it shouldn't be the only opportunity. I agree. Um, yeah. 
it's um it's just one of those situations that i haven't seen any other plan in front of council to this degree we've we've heard some uh, interesting concepts we do not have the details i'm prepared to support the de the, the the concept of this right now and we're still going to have two weeks and um, we'll hear from more constituents, um, both pro and con, and they'll have an op another opportunity in, in a couple of weeks to, to come back and address council directly. Um, I think his worship is correct with respect to the supply of housing. I tried to use, you know, elementary math there, 2.4 million. My esteemed colleague beside me says, Gary, if you can get a, uh, an apartment for $1,000 in Peterborough, good luck. I just used the $1,000 times 12 months because it worked with the 2.4 million. It was an, an easy round figure. What we really do need is permanent housing with supports in place, but it's gonna take us time to get there. Uh, we can't build what we need in the next three or four months. Um, it, it's just not practical to do it, you, you can't. So in the interim, we have to have something in place that's better than what we've got now. Uh, I'm prepared to um, to have this particular plan um, have a look at it, and I'm hopeful that staff will come back with the details um, that we've kind of discussed tonight. The one question I did have, Mr. Chair, and I don't know if this could be addressed. Um, I know there's one one person in the vicinity, probably more than one that I've heard from, that has a business there, and will probably decide on whether he's going to move his business based on the decisions of council over the next next couple of weeks. Another person asked me um, if we went ahead with this proposal, will the city purchase my home? Because it's, it's too untenable to continue to reside in Wall Street. Um, I, couldn't, I couldn't answer the question. I'm not sure staff can answer the question because it's a budgetary item, but there's that degree of, of personal ownership and a change in, in their own personal circumstance because of what they're seeing us discuss this evening. I'll just leave that food for thought. Those would be my comments, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Baldwin. Councillor Crowley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm, I'm gonna agree with what Councillor Burke said. Um, it's absolutely fundamentally, this concept is better than what we have currently. Uh, as someone who has been down to the Wolf Street encampment, it is, goddamn mess down there it really is it is a lot of people high acuity um with mental health and addiction issues under high stress um who feel potentially like they're ignored and marginalized trying to survive living in a tent which is not housing uh, I know that there's people that say housing first includes tents and it does not because it's not safe. It's not secure. It's why you don't need a permit to set it up in the middle of a, a parking lot. Um, people die in them. People burn them down with propane heaters. We're looking at trying to make sure that um, they are supported in the winter and we have to get them out. We have to get them in. Like living in a tent is not a viable solution for someone who has a mental health addiction or is extremely impoverished. Um, it's, I, I feel absolutely terrible for everybody that lives in the vicinity of the encampment as well, because not only are these people in the encampment under high stress uh, and dealing, you know, trying to survive day to day, but all of that stress is uh, spilling into the downtown core. It's spilling into Dal our Dalhousie and, and Elmer and George and all around there. It's just, it's not good period for anybody. And I think that we have done, um, I think the city has, has tried valiantly over the last few years to do something, but the best thing that, that uh, potentially came out of it was why don't we open up a shelter the rehill lot and it's for anybody who's been to that shelter it's i mean it's it's a dog and pony show in there i mean they try their hardest but it's just a big empty room it's it's not a great place to live so at the very least this gives somebody an opportunity to get out of a tent get into somewhere where they can have their own space 
which is for the most part why people are living in tents because they're not good with people they don't they they don't like crowds they love the feeling of community it, it does that i agree with mayor leal that the age of tenting needs to end because i i i've and I've said, I said this to Councillor Burke today, I, I don't like tenting. I don't like people sleeping in tents, not for the reason that it's, oh, it's unsightly and it looks terrible, but there needs to be a better solution. And if there's not a better solution, which there currently isn't, then maybe society at large has failed in some way. So this allows us to eliminate tenting, get people inside, address them, address their problems, address their issues, and... I think it, it, it helps. It's a, it's a concept currently. I'm going to support it. I would love to see the details. I can't wait to actually see what the details say, but I mean, it, it's better than what we have. It's the best plan. It would be nice to see a plan B or a plan C, but this is plan A and this is what we got. So, yeah. So I think I'm going to support it. So thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Crowley. Councillor Lachica. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to take the opportunity again uh, to, to think about the presentation um, by our city staff and, and recognizing their expertise. And there's a, there's a later report that talks about, you know, the role of city staff and, and their relationship to council. You know, we, we all come from different pathways in our lives, but certainly who we have on city staff that, that have applied themselves to this file and to this strategy and to this approach, it's, it's second to none. And, and I think that, you know, we, we don't have just something. We have something that is the best there is that's out there. And we have the opportunity as a city to embrace it and say, yes, other communities are trying this. No, it's not perfect. And no, it isn't the, the end. The, it isn't the end. It isn't, it isn't uh, permanent housing, but it is transitional housing. And for Peterborough and, and for cities like us, that, are, that struggle with funding for housing, we are doing everything we can to, to escalate, to expedite the building of our housing as our, as our mayor is, is talking about. We have to do that. And we recognize that that's part of the equation. And, and I, I, just, I just want to laud our, those professionals with the expertise who've done their research, who's, who have had the commitment, who've worked with the data and the evidence that shows that this is working and it's effective. If we make this decision tonight, we're making a good decision, a sound decision and a strategic one. If we wanna be a future ready city, we are going to address our homeless crisis. It's the most important thing we could do for our whole community. This is a whole city issue, not just a ward issue. And I think we're being bold and courageous and strong together as a team if we make this decision today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Lachica. I have Councillor Purnell, Duguay for a second time, and Burke for a third and final. Councillor Purnell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have a couple of questions. Um, I can see how the vote is going to go um, on this, and, and I know it's going to take some time to build these modular homes. We're probably looking at least the fall before they'll be available. Um, so what, Mr. Chair, uh, through you, is the plan for this summer for um, for the Wolf Street encampment, for the neighbors, for the whole downtown, um, and even farther out for the downtown sustainability. Um, we need to know how we're going to actually manage this this summer. I think people need to know that. All right, this, this summer. Is the microphones working back there or no? Oh, sorry. I I uh, know. Yeah, I yeah. guess it is. Um, we would be looking at some of the interim steps. Um, one of the concerns that is is in, in the sorry, one of the concerns that exists now is lack of bathroom facilities. So I think we would be looking at what we can do in the short term to try in the very short term to try to alleviate some of the concerns that neighbors have. Um, but again, this would be time to be talking to the people who are living in tents to try to understand what the best 
how we can best serve their needs. So um, in the sh in the very short term, um, there will not be a, a solution to tenting at Wolf Street, but we will be working towards that. There are some of the options for the modular housing, and there's a lot of there's a lot of pieces to unpack. But some of the options for the modular housing are basically available to be shipped. So um, it's not all not everything we're looking at has to be constructed. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. To further that, though, but we we've been talking about this. Um, um, our esteemed colleagues over there are not the only ones who have been working on this very hard for quite some time. Um, and I understand there was some, a lot of homework done on portables, but they do not meet Ontario building code. So are there portables available quickly that do meet Ontario building code and fire code? And how sustainable are they? Do we know? So um, if, if, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, so that has been, um, again, we, we obviously are not purchasing these until we find out if council is going to support this this month. But we have investigated various options. There's numerous companies involved in, in produ producing these. Um, there are some available, as Ms. Morgan Quinn said, constructed right now in Quebec, um, some of which do meet the Ontario Building Code. To your point, some of them don't, unfortunately. So we need to be careful about that and working through the details. But we have identified some that exist. And that our hope would be that we could transition some happening as sooner than later, while others will have to be in the queue to be constructed. So there probably will be a spectrum of, of options we're buying, ones that are available right now and others that we have to get in the queue for construction. Thank you very much, Councillor Purnell. Councillor Duguay for a second time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a question I should have asked earlier or perhaps I should have included in my previous remarks, is that staff have outlined for our benefit that the city um, is coordinating um, a social housing and homelessness programs on behalf of the city and the county. Um, on page two of this staff report under budget and financial implications that our statement made that um, insofar as the overall budget, the contribution today from the county is 208000 of a $6,934,000 budget. I believe there was a, um, a reach out to the county to see if they would uh, contemplate providing additional funding and they were awaiting the um, outcome and the announcement of the HBP program. Now that we know that we are potentially uh, eligible for funding, I'm curious if F staff or perhaps Mayor Leo, if you would know if the county has now responded in a more positive manner to provide additional and more necessary and proportionate monies towards homelessness because we provide all the shelter beds all the services are provided in this city there are no shelter beds there are no facilities in any of the counties member municipalities we are shouldering this responsibility and when i look at the proportionate amount of monies it just simply doesn't add up so perhaps then with the hpp program announcement, perhaps the county might be uh, more inclined to provide additional funding. And I'm going to say this uh, in terms of the debate, perhaps as part of our medium and long term strategy, the city could be dialoguing with the county and its member municipalities that they consider at the municipal level providing shelter facilities for their municipal residents. Why is the city burdening the entire responsibility? And that's something, it's, it's a much more involved in political discussion, but perhaps this whole program may open up that opportunity. So my one question is, has the county responded favorably that they give us more money? Because in this report, they were waiting for this announcement. Thank you. Mayor Leo, can you answer that? Um, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, to, uh, to Mr. Duguay. I, I think this is a, um, a topic that we could bring to joint services uh, because this is a social service issue. Uh, the the uh, county, uh, to be fair to them, uh, the county was waiting for uh, the announcement uh, by uh, by MPP Mr. Smith and the Minister of Minnesota Affairs and Housing uh, for Ontario, uh, the Honourable Steve Clark. The reality is, when a decision was made in 1996 in the province of Ontario, uh, the downloading of uh, housing 
and homelessness would occur. The city of Peterborough was designated as a service manager at that particular time. The county of Peterborough was designated to provide emergency services uh, to the city of Peterborough at that particular time. And that's how that uh, whole situation evolved. So we always have uh, very positive uh, um, conversations uh, uh, with our elected colleagues in the county. And this is something that uh, we can clearly put on the agenda of the night of the next joint services committee. Thank you. So with that, I have uh, Mayor Leal for a second time. Thank you very much uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to Mr. Laidman. Mr. Laidman, between now and the council meeting, uh, would it be um, uh, possible to get an inventory of modular homes that might be available uh, that make uh, that meet the Ontario Building Code standards? If we made some inquiries to like ATCO in, in Alberta uh, or the companies in Quebec, so we could get a uh, for want of a better term, an inventory, what's available on the on an immediate basis. And how many? S certainly, yeah, through you, Mr. Chair, I, I think we could endeavor to do that. As I mentioned already, certainly staff in our, in our um, project management office have already undertaken some of that research already, so we can certainly pass that along to council. Great, thank you, Mayor Leal. Uh, speakers, um, Councillor Hakey. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm gonna ask if we can separate out B, this report. Yep, sure, we can do that. That's uh, all the unanswered questions category, I believe. <clears throat> and that's, I, I, I'd be surprised if we can make a decision without the information that B provides. Um, I can support the rest of the uh, report because it makes a lot of sense. But I wanted to read a list that doesn't surprise me on one hand, where I asked some questions, very pointed questions. Is this a lower, no barrier shelter? And the answer was, yeah, uh, no, it is not. I'm uh, sorry, the answer is yes, it is low barrier shelter which means you can bring drugs and uh, alcohol into it. Um, I don't know why we as a city, with the pinch of money, try and recreate a wheel when we have Kingston, Timmins, Hamilton, Sudbury, Toronto with 11, Oshawa, Barrie, with low or no barrier shelters, all within two hour drive from here. So there's 17, 17 shelters. Um, that are available. Um, where should it go? I don't know. But I know it shouldn't be going into a residential neighborhood that has a cul-de-sac that's located downtown. I don't believe you can build one community up while you're tearing down an existing community. And it's unfair and it's awful and I agree but I think until we get the answers of B and then the rest of the report comes back with other options that are available to the city in terms of land that either we can buy or land that already exists, I think it's very important that we vote uh, separately on that. Um, they talk about the, oh, the other question that I asked that, that uh, we're all talking about getting rid of tents and both ends of this deal want the tents gone. I don't believe for a minute that anybody wants tents to remain, but the fact is that they can. If they choose to not go into anything we're providing and Councillor Burke um, said, you know, we're meeting them where they're at. Well, if they don't like what we're providing now, where's the at? How, how much further do we have to go to meet people? And I understand that there's prevailing issues which is mental health and addictions. And that's, for people that know me, they understand where I, where I tend to tread. I think this report is very good. It's very timely, but it still doesn't give us what his worship said, what everybody's looking for, which is the no tent scenario. Um, moving, and to, to Councillor Duguay's point, and I totally agree, what's wrong with, getting a location in Selwyn that has bus service in the Tonneby South Monaghan 
in Duro Dummer, in Cavett, and sharing, because we talk about sharing things. My kids talk the same way. When they say share something, it really means I'm going to pay and, and they enjoy it. And, but that's what we're talking about here. And the inequity, people are suffering out there, no question. And I don't think anybody disagrees with that. Every single taxpayer that I've spoken to wants to help, wants to do what's right. But I, I can tell you from personal experience, and they talk about following the data, and this is what blows my mind. You follow the data, and the data says what we're doing isn't working, which is providing things with no barrier, not providing the wraparound services that's required. Not Now, so the, the flip side of that is what could be worse? You're living in a compound. You are locked in or locked out. And it stands as what in the community? A sign. And it's a poor sign. And we're not the only community suffering from this. But it's time that we all shared the load. And I'm talking about the five counties around, or the five municipalities around us also. And it's not just about the money, but it's about, it's about the access. It's about servicing. I read where other communities had concentrated all the services downtown to make it convenient. Well, they're, they're now talking about spreading those services out in different areas within their own city. Makes sense on one hand, might make it a bit awkward for others, but I think we're talking about supplying services that will work. That's where I hope we're going with this. But if we can support, if we can separate those out, I will not support B. Um, but I would certainly support the rest of the report because I think it's important. Um, there's a lot of good information. There's a, a lot of work done on this. And it is, and, and I'm going to speak for myself, it's very much appreciated, even though there's two opposite ends here. Thank you. Thank you. So I see the speakers, but Mr. Uh, Commissioner Freeman, I, I saw your hand. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I can just, just make one point, and, and it's been alluded to a couple of times, but I just want to draw attention to it. And and that is the, the, the amount of money that the county is paying, the $208,000. The county is paying the amount that we agreed to that's included in the CMSM agreement that the parties, the municipalities agreed to. I just want to make that point. And so I also want to make the point that that in the context of the most recent discussions, and, and Councillor DeGay referred, alluded to it, there was an ask, and, and just as, as the county was about to respond, of course, the province, we, we got wind of, of the fact that the province was going to respond, and it was, only, it was only appropriate that they would pause their consideration until they found out what the new information was. So I understand exactly where they come from. So in the meantime, if, if, and, and His Worship alluded to it, you know, there's a need to have a further consultation or conversation at Joint Services, PRLC, P Peterborough Regional Liaison Committee. And in addition to that, I've also reached out and we've had conversations with Ms. Graham, the CAO of the county, about whether it would be appropriate to come and address county council. So I just, I just wanted to say all that and bring that information to the table. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. And uh, Commissioner Laidman, just something to ponder, just separating out B. If you could just let me know in 10 minutes, would we vote on B first and then everything or everything and then B? So I just leave that with you. I didn't know. But I'd just be able to answer. I'd just oh, yeah, comment you know. on, that, on that possibility. And I, I fully understand that B is the crux of, of this report. I certainly, I, I would be very apprehensive to say that the report works without B. Yeah. And and um, I understand why certainly if it's if it's factored out that, that we would still pursue other elements of of the report but i would staff would be recommending that that council just ask staff to come back with the revised approach rather than take out b okay. that would be our preference as staff understood okay thank you y yes l's in there and that's the part of the main motion okay so speakers i have councillor Purnell a second time burke a third and final councillor real a second time Purnell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just to, to further a couple of points, I do appreciate um, our partners in, in the county and what has been said, and they are a financial partner 
to a much lesser degree, but that was the agreement. We do need to revisit those agreements because it's not just this direct cost. We are the ones, our taxpayers are the ones who are bearing the police costs, the public works costs, our transit affects our transit revenues and everything else, um, consumes our property standards department. So there are significant additional costs. And I don't believe we can use any of this 2.5 million extra homeless money to help us subsidize or pay for those costs that we are incurring. Um, but to my colleague's point, I do think we need to add the word county to H so that the city will use its funding and in brackets, municipal, which means city, in my opinion, county, provincial, and federal. Add the word county in there because they do need to be significant partners with us on this. Is that, would that be taken as a friendly amendment? Okay, Councillor uh, Riel, no, no pressure, but friendly or? Yeah, eight. eight. So in the brackets, it would be municipal, county, provincial, and federal. It could be city, county, provincial, federal, to make it clearer. Okay, so that's agreed upon. So I've got, uh, that'll be a friendly amendment, uh, Councillor Riel and Parnell, municipal, county, provincial, and federal. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so I have uh, Councillor Burke, a third and final, Riel a second, and Mary Leal, third and final. Councillor Burke. Um, yeah, thanks through you, Chair Beamer. I just want to reiterate what um, Commissioner Laidman said, where I, I don't, I do not agree with separating B from this. B is the plan and it's it's how we're rushing to the acuteness of the problem. And I feel like we need to vote on everything as a whole um, to give it any sort of any sort of roots. Um, and just to respond to some of the conversation around barrier free, around harm reduction, around what's working in other cities. Um, you know, what I've experienced this winter is we have an overflow shelter that has 32 beds, it has two staff and it has army cots. Um, and while that was running at the same time as, our, as the stop gap, which is, is, is more of a model that, that this plan is leaning towards, what we saw was that when it was minus 40 in the winter time, we had beds open in the overflow, but the stop gap was at capacity, right? So we can do two things. We can continue to build and put money into services that aren't meeting the needs of people that are unhoused, or we can systemically start to look at some of the failures in what we're doing and, and, and open up um, to, to systems that are actually going to serve people, right? There's so many inadequacies in the current way in which we're spending money and trying to house people and trying to fit people into this system that's not working. And, and, and this report looks at that. And it's taking the overflow and it's opening it up. It's allowing it to be more of a drop in space um, based on what's worked in our community this, current, this past winter, and we don't have the luxury of time on our hands, right? It, or it's spring, it's gonna be summer. We have a lot of work to do, to do on this plan to make sure that it's gonna be successful, right? We have to consult with the neighbors. We have to consult with the agencies, right? There's, there's like about, I think someone said in a meeting, there's about a trillion things we have to do if this passes, you know? And so if this doesn't pass tonight, we're back at square one. Right. We can we can recommend all the all the everything but B, but we still don't have a plan. We still have to deal with the current reality, which, yes, you're right, Councillor Hakey, we can all agree upon that the current reality is not working. Right. So what happens if we don't if we don't um, if we don't accept this plan, we still have no plan and things continue to get worse. So I support this. I, I have faith that it's going to work. I have faith that over time the neighborhood will come to see that it's going to address the needs of the community while we work towards that midterm, those midterm and long-term goals. Um, one of the questions that's come up is like, will like the post-it note analogy, is this going to last forever? Once we build this, will it stay, et cetera, et cetera. So I had a question for Mr. Freeman or Mr. Laidman. Um, aren't there plans eventually like within a 10 year scope that look at the rehill lot to drastically change the face of what that does? We have the entertainment, district plan that I've seen, and then we have a potential um, change in the use of that land if, if a via rail gets developed. That was a question, sorry. It may, be a, may have been a difficult one. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I don't think there's any specific plan that, that speaks to what the eventual use, but we, 
that I, that property or that area of properties has been identified as having strategic value for the things that you've just discussed in the future for our central area master plan, like a potential via station, like potential excess parking um, for whatever other purposes. So there's lots of strategic value to still have that property within our portfolio for sure. Thank you. And then just on the record, while everyone's listening, um, you said this to me, Commissioner Laidman, that, that, you know, some people have been presenting the idea that we just clear the encampment, we move it, we were done with it, that's it, right? But, but what this plan is presenting is a more empathetic approach. It's going to resource the area and it's going to represent what you've described as like a weaning off of Wolf Street, right? So that, that does mean that we're going to move to something different eventually, correct? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, certainly that is staff's intention, that that's, that's the ultimate goal to wean ourselves off of Wolf Street and, and disperse uh, and, and provide better supportive housing in the long term, as the plan suggests. Thank you. Um, and through the chair, just finally, if, if, you know, we're hearing a lot of, we're hearing some criticism at the plan and like, I'm really interested at this council table to hear about solutions. You know, this is a really good solution, solution that's backed by people that are knowledgeable and that are expertise in this field. And that's why I support this. Um, I'm open to anyone else's ideas, and I think that now would be the time to present those ideas. If you're not going to, if you're not going to vote for this plan, um, because of the extreme emergency nature of this crisis, I would, I would be willing to listen to any plans that anyone wants to put on the table tonight if they have a better plan. All right. Thank you, Councillor Burke. Councillor Riel, for a second time. Um, through the chair, certainly um, allude to the remarks that were made about B. This is the plan. B is the essence of the whole thing. And so I know that uh, Councillor Hakey has a right to separate things out. But without B, we don't have a plan. This is the money part of the plan that we need to move forward and do things. We're, you know, I, we're, we're in a crisis here. Let's forget about it. Here, we're spending another a whole night. This is May the 8th. If we don't get moving on this here, and we spend a, a, a considerable amount of time looking at alternate sites, where can we go? Where will the people go? If we move them off of Wolf Street onto some field somewhere, they're gonna migrate back into downtown. Excuse me very much. So this myth that all of a sudden, if we find this uh, magical place for these people, everything is gonna be great. We looked at this here. We said, we need to get people housed. Right today, people are tenting in Millennium Park. People are tenting in East City at the ball. People are tenting all over the city. It is starting. The crisis is not happening. It's just out down on Wolf Street. We got a tenting problem. If you want to think 2019, it'll look like a Sunday social from what happened then to what's going to happen now. And that's not fear mongering. We've got to get this plan going. We've got to get these things bought as quickly as possible. We got to move them on site. We got to get the plan that we have in place. This is the first meeting I was at a week ago with all of the agencies where they all said, we can buy into this. We need wraparound services from these agencies. I'm talking about CMHA. I'm talking about Elizabeth Fry. I'm talking about John Howard. I'm talking about Forecast. I'm talking about all the major agencies helping us with the people that are marginalized, that have an addiction problem, that have a mental health problem to help us with these people. This is the plan. Is it forever and a day? No. I'm also the chair of housing for the Peterborough Housing Corp. We are going to build housing. It's an expensive proposition, but it's not gonna happen overnight. We have a plan to do that. But right now we have a crisis of trying to get these people that are, that are homeless and marginalized into some sort of form of housing instead of a tent. This is the plan. Thank you very much, Councillor uh, Riel. Count, uh, Mayor Leal for a third and final. Thanks very much. Um, I would uh, be very cautious in response to Councillor Purdell that we blindside the County of Peterborough this evening. I think the more appropriate approach would be for Mr. Friedman to have a discussion with Sheridan Graham tomorrow, uh, indicate that uh, uh, we're um, um, moving forward with this plan tonight. Let us find out what the involvement potentially would be of the County of Peterborough under our joint services agreement and have that information available for us uh, when council appears in two weeks. 
look, we have some pretty sensitive issues with the county of Peterborough. And every time we blindside the county of Peterborough, they just put their backs up even further. I've never liked the politics of blindsiding anybody. And it's to our disadvantage to blindside them on this issue when we need them to be participants with us. All right, thank you, Mayor Leal. Any further, any further comments or questions? Uh, Councillor Purnell for a third and final. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not blindsiding the county. I'm talking about the money that's in this budget. There's a $208,000. Hopefully they will come up with more. There's no blindside here. They're already partners on this, and that is absolutely not the intention. It's part of the part of the funding formula as it is now with the city, the county, the province, and the federal government. It is not a blindside, sir. Thank you. No, unfortunately. <laughs> Sorry. Set the oh, okay, so thank you, Councillor Pernell. Councillor Duguay for a third and final. Thank you, Chair Lemer. Um, perhaps it was my remarks that prompted this um, discussion around the county. Um, it wasn't your worship intended to uh, be detrimental to the county, but rather saying this might open up the door to allow for dialogue, more meaningful dialogue with the county. Now, I had one I had one question though with um, to staff on item B, which is the content, which is the item. It spins on item B. Uh, the paragraph reads the provision of modular temporary housing. We've heard earlier the phraseology, you know, we're going to stay in a lane. We've got to be quick. We're going to have to be it. Like, we can drive the solution. Could staff for the council meeting at which the decision will be made. We're receiving a report for information tonight. Can staff come back um, in, um, in addition to modular home uh, suppliers with a specific timeline uh, regarding the temporary housing? So in other words, will it be one year? Will it be two years or will it be three years? Because temporary to me means if we use a temporary use bylaw in planning terms, it's three years, it's not more. So again, we're, so, we're in the driver's seat can we come back that can staff come back to provide some indication of the tenure and, and timing of the word temporary, how long it might be temporary. Commissioner Leadman. Yeah, through you chair Beamer. I'm, I, I understand the concern. I, I guess we can look at that over the intervening two weeks. I'm not really sure at this point, whether we'll be able to commit to what the temporary, our, our purpose was to use the word temporary with, to, to identify what the nature of this is long-term is not meant to be permanent versus temporary. Again, I, I'm not sure we can commit to what the time frame is, but we can certainly look at it over the intervening two weeks. I think that would be very helpful information for our council meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duguay. All right, any further comments or questions? Okay, so I think uh, if you can read out else, because it was new, and then we'll take a vote. Did you want it separated out? Okay, so we'll, we'll read L, and then we'll separate out B from the rest of the report. So L currently reads that the city established a community liaison committee composed of five to seven individuals, including a town ward councillor and a member of the Peterborough Police Force. Okay. So we'll take a vote on A to L minus B. And I, I, I know I hear the arguments, but committee members are allowed to separate out. So we'll take a, we'll take a vote A, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L. Okay. Can I just ask a question, Chair Beamer? Sure. Question for clarification. Are we able to vote on whether or not we separated or not? No, any, no. anyone we can, can request this. Good question though. I, I, yeah, I think the clerk said A to L minus B. So I'm just report. So, so that's moved by Councillor L. We'll take a vote. All right, that is carried everyone. And then we'll do B. I don't need to read it. It's in front of everyone. So moved by Councillor Riel, B. Oh, weren't you? I'm sorry, I thought you were. 
or are we deleting it? That's right, but someone still has to move the B. Yeah, so that's counts surreal. So move by counts surreal. Counselor Duguay, if you can. Yeah, of course. And that is carried. All right, thanks everyone. Good discussion. We will take a vote or just take a, a break and reconvene in 10 minutes. Okay, one minute warning, one minute warning. Thirty second warning, thirty second warning. All right, we'll reconvene this uh, meeting. Just a friendly reminder to my, uh, I guess everyone in the room, um, sometimes people listening and watching at home can hear um, idle chit chat. So just make sure your mic is always off. And even when it is off, just be mindful that, uh, you know, of our conversations around the table. Um, not that they're inappropriate, but people can hear them. So let's just let the, the person speaking uh, speak and we all listen and no side chatter. 
All right, um, committee reports, 12A2, members of council staff relations policy, Councillor Riel. Um, through the chair to Mr. Freeman, I guess you're one of the authors of this here. And my question has to do about communications. Um, you know, I, I know this policy talks about staff and, uh, and counselors relationship, but I mean, my question is, is, is about um, staff and uh, certainly counselors asking staff um, to respond to um, uh, constituents um, needs or questions getting back to counselors in a, um, in a uh, timely fashion. Um, in this day and age, um, the expectations of constituents, uh, they have a very short, uh, uh, well, I shouldn't say attention span. They want an answer right away. And certainly with uh, the advent of certainly computers um, or cell phones and certainly iPads, um, when we don't get back in a timely manner, they're starting to phone and email us again. Why didn't we get a response or a question? Um, I don't think probably two things are happening. Either they've tried to reach out to city staff and didn't get either the answer they want or they didn't get through, or they're cutting to the chase and coming to council or they get the, their questions answered. So I didn't see anything in this staff report that highlighted that about the relationship of communication. There seems to be a communication problem within the city um, for us getting answers back in a timely manner so that we can do the work that we're elected to do for the constituent. Is that making sense or am I kind of off base here a bit? Sorry, Commissioner, now I'm listening to myself not speak, but go ahead, Commissioner. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, um, and as the councillor aptly points out, I mean, this policy is really predominantly about communication between council members of council and staff. And, and, and he's absolutely right. I mean, communications is, is a broad topic and, and there is definitely a need to have ensure we have robust communications between constituents and the city of Peterborough. And certainly to that point, I mean, we have been working diligently on, on getting those tools in place. I mean, we have, we have uh, implemented recently online portals, for instance, where individual members, you know, constituents and citizens of Peterborough can, can, you know, reach out and contact the city of Peterborough directly electronically. They can, you know, we have a, currently we have a report and issue form on our website. There's thousands actually of responses to, to issues that are reported there. So that is actively being managed. We have, um, you know, and this worship and I have, have just recently been chatting about to service Peterborough and how do we move that forward in terms of a one-stop shop. And, and that part of that would be enhancing communication again. And so I think there's, there's a number of ways that we can get at that. And, and to your point, we need to have, make sure that we have customer service standards in place whereby we're meeting the expectations. And if an individual constituent is reaching out to the city of Peterborough, there should be a standard in place in which they would receive a response. That's not unreasonable. Uh, admittedly, it's getting, it's difficult sometimes to manage those expectations. So I don't know if that, that provides all your answers, but that's certainly some of the things that we're doing in terms of, uh, you know, at the city of Peterborough and, um, uh, getting those tools in place, getting the service standard established, and, and to the, even to the point of getting a customer relationship management uh, uh, tool in place, that's part of our SAP project, and we're actively working on that. So, Through the chair, I'll move the report, but I mean, the standard for me, and this is something I learned from a former president of a union, I answer people within 24 hours. I may not have the answer for them, but I've responded to them that I've heard their concern and I try to get back to them as quickly as possible. And that's kind of a standard I put for myself. I'm not saying that city staff can do the same thing, but that's the standard I have. I think, like I said, in today's world, the expectation for people are very high, especially with counselors. They want you to get back to them with an answer to their question. And when we're asking staff, and I know that they have busy days and they don't get back to us in a timely fanner, manner, we're starting to get phone calls and emails. Why didn't you get back to me and phone me and tell me what's going on? And that's all the point I was making. I'll 
I'll move the report, but I think, I think that I didn't see that in the report here. And I thought that that was a point that I wanted to bring up about communications. Great, thank you. Yep, thank you very much, Councillor Ariel. Uh, speaking to that, Mayor Leal. Yeah, just a point, um, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, we're hopefully uh, maybe having a preliminary report about service Peterborough available or coming to a committee of the whole in June. And one of the, the great concepts, uh, I believe, uh, about service Peterborough, as I've canvassed um, a number of individuals on this topic, is just what Councillor Riel is, is talking about, how we, we can quicken response uh, through this mechanism uh, going forward, to the kind of response uh, that we all anticipate. And it's all about the responses we're providing for the good folks uh, uh, that are, are, are out there. And that's what the intent of moving forward by consolidating one-stop shopping and getting uh, responses uh, as quickly as we can uh, put them together. Thank you very much for that, Mayor Leal. Any further comments or questions? Moved by Councillor Riel, we'll take a vote. Well, I'll just announce that good news, Peterborough Peets did win three to two. So that's exciting and and bring on London. So very exciting. And with that, Councillor Hakey, we need your vote. All right. And that is carried. Thanks everyone. 12A3, correspondence regarding ASIC uh, appointment, uh, uh, Mayor Leal. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, that report, uh, CLS CLK 23-013, be received for information, and that the City uh, Council support and accept the appointment of the County of Peterborough nominated by a council member for the Airport Strategic Initiative Committee without any, re without any preconditions for a one-year term. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I could just uh, reflect upon Go ahead. So, you're, you're... So, so, Mayor Leal, I've been advised that we'll need first uh, two-thirds reconsideration yeah, vote, and if that passes, then then you can continue. So, okay. um, we there's no debate on a reconsideration; it's simply a vote. So, uh, we'll take a vote. We need two-thirds to uh, proceed with this motion. And thank you for your guidance, Mr. Chair. I kind of missed that spot over here. So, we'll take a vote. And that is carried. So, uh, Mayor Leal, you can continue. Thanks very much, Mr. Chair. That re report CLSCLK 23-013 be received for information and be that the City Council support and accept the appointment of the County Peter Rowe nominated council member to the Airport Strategic Initiative Committee without any preconditions uh, for a period of one year. Um, Mr. Chair, a number of weeks ago, we had the, uh, uh, the airport... Uh, uh, summit meeting. I think uh, those of us that were in attendance uh, found it a very um, informative session about the employment levels and future activities at Peterborough Regional Airport. Uh, but one of the things uh, I believe the Strategic Planning Committee should be looking at is the true creation of a, a Peterborough Regional Airport Authority. Uh, there was some indication at the airport uh, summit uh, that the City of Quartha Lake, Northumberland and Hastings may indeed uh, might be interested in joining us um, on the three priorities that we have, the control tower, uh, the introduction, introduction of technology to land in bad weather and customs clearing that would certainly hope uh, and support all businesses uh, in the area. So uh, with those uh, brief remarks, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I believe we can uh, move forward with this two recommendations. Thank you for that, Mayor Leal. Any uh, comments or questions on the recommendation? All right, moved by Mary Lee, we'll take a vote. Mr. Chair, if I Oops, could sorry. add yep. a bit of a clarification. So the motion is gonna read that D and E of the original motion be rescinded because yep. that, that added the um, qualifications in and that we're adding a new A and B yes. that you read out. Correct.
Can you just read the, the last sentence of that? It should be a council member to the airport strategic committee without reservations and for a term of one year. Okay, I think maybe we missed the one year in that. If we can just, half of us have already voted, but. Yes, yeah, so we'll vote again on that. Councillor Hickey had to leave, so yeah, I should have said that, so he's won't be voting. Oh, you did. And that, yeah, it's got to us. So that is carried uh, 12A5, Transit Budget Considerations. Councillor Riel. Um, through the chair, I will be asking for deferral of this report until the Transit Liaison Committee meets to make recommendations to council surrounding changes that will be made to transit. The committee has not met, but we are having a meeting, our first meeting this week on Thursday at two o'clock. In consultation with the acting CEO, Richard Freeman, he stated to me that an email that the financial impacts running council uh, would not be felt until late September, or early October. This gives the transit liaison committee ample time to meet and make recommendations to council about what changes to count to transit are needed. Council would be well, um, council would be well underway with the 2024 budget and if necessary, we could keep transit going financially for three months uh, until we have a new budget ratified in two for 2024. Again, I believe uh, a deferral is an order to give transit liaison committee, which this council sanctioned uh, a chance uh, to do their job. Making the uh, much needed changes to transit to entice riders back on the buses with reliable on-time service. All right, thank you very much for that, Councillor Riel, and thank you for all you're doing tonight, Councillor Riel, I know you're not feeling well, so thank you. Um, so move to defer, Councillor DeGay. Thank you, uh, Chair Beamer. Um, as a newly appointed um, uh, reference, council representatives to this committee, I also concur with the um, deferral. Uh, a very important inaugural meeting of the committee, committee meeting will be held um, this week. And I have every faith in this process that this is good information for the committee to have about some of the consequences of the one the decision we made during budget. But it would be premature to, uh, to really, let's await for the transit committee, review committee to finish their work and start their work. And I, I concur with my colleagues uh, um, um, deferral recommendation. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Duguay. I have Mayor Leal and Councillor Baldwin. Mayor Leal. Thanks very much, Mr. Chair. And uh, I'll support the deferral, but uh, I really wanna thank uh, Commissioner Reyna for bringing this forward because the numbers in here uh, do present a stark reality. Uh, and I think that stark reality will be important uh, as the transit Liaison Committee uh, uh, starts their deliberations. Uh, it allows them to know the parameters in which, uh, you know, they're going to be ha handling discussions. And at, at the end of the day, uh, you know, the Transit Liaison Committee may be looking at, at, at these uh, uh, recommendations and uh, proposals that are contained in this report. Thank you very much for that, Mayor Leal. I have Councillor Baldwin, Lechica, and Vasliadis. Councillor Baldwin. Yeah, just very quickly, Mr. Chair, I actually want to thank uh, Mr. Rayner, Commissioner Rayner for the report. I think anybody that uh, was involved in budget deliberations uh, when we were 
uh, if they didn't know they were going to have some ramifications, um, they certainly do by reading the report. The rubber is going to hit the road here uh, with respect to those budget decisions. So, again, I thank uh, thank Commissioner for the report, and uh, we'll let the liaison committee weigh in on that, and then we'll go from there. I did have one question, if I could, Mr. Chair, uh, through you to uh, our acting CEO with respect to uh, the councillor's comments about budget. Or would you be able just to verify that what was said there in terms of having no financial impact until I believe October was the date. Would you mind uh, just giving certainly myself, uh, Mr. Freeman, uh, an update with respect to that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, certainly, um, you know, first of all, let me express the fact that, that staff look forward to working with the Transit Liaison Committee. So we look forward to having those discussions and, and bringing back some additional information and recommendations at the appropriate time. And and just before my comment to to Councillor Baldwin, uh, Mr. Chairman, it would be it would be good to know um, if the report is deferred. Uh, what what is the timeline to bring it back? So if I if we could just get clarity around that, that would be helpful. But but just to answer the councillor's question, and certainly you know as we as we go forward here, uh, you know there there are financial impacts being incurred. And uh, it's important to move, you know, sooner rather than later in terms of adjusting levels of service, uh, Mr. Chairman. Right now, you know, we're we're spending monies that we don't have in the budget. So, so there is impacts right now. They're ongoing. Um, there is some urgency around this, and 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 we do need to uh, realign the levels of service. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Baldwin. Uh, Councillor Lachika. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I just wanted to well, thank Commissioner Reyna for the report and, and also just what it underscores in terms of, of the impact of, of looking for efficiencies in an area that um, is, is meaningful to all of our community and all of our taxpayers. I've, I know that I've, I've heard a great deal from, from community um, this week um, around the impact of these efficiencies and how they've been itemized um, to seniors, to those living with disabilities. Um, you know, a letter from the Council for Persons with Disabilities. Sometimes, you know, as we know, um, the ridership isn't necessarily um, evaluated only on a high number or a low number, but on those that are represented through their accessibility to transit. So um, just appreciative for the opportunity to defer and and to to always think about and and I know that the um, the transit liaison committee and and those represented there will will raise this and and the things that um, we need to be thinking about as we move forward to new budgets and what a priority transit is for sustainability. Um, for um, equity um, and transportation mode share, because those are things that, that we know are priorities and we've made those decisions as a council. So they're a learning in this uh, for me and, and um, hopefully we'll, we'll think further about that. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very, thank you very much for that, Councillor Lachika. Councillor Vasliadis. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll support the deferral. And uh, when, you know, when I look at some of the items on here, uh, you know, you have the, the statutory holiday service. I think that was one of my first motions I made back in my very first term to to get that uh, approved. And then, yeah, community bus service, that looks familiar too. And there's, so there's a lot of things here that it's interesting. And uh, the reason, again, I was one of the, the creators of the motion for the uh, Transit Liaison Committee and, and the whole thinking behind that was to get the experts around the table, people actually take transit and to get their opinion on such things like this. So. I would like to hear from them. I'd like to see what a pri what priorities they believe. If we're going to make any cuts, what they would think of of uh, the recommendations here. So I think it's uh, appropriate to defer it. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Vasliadis. Any further comments or questions? Well, just quickly, I guess I I was the one who made the motion back in January. Um, I'll support the deferral as well. Um, and again, I, I do sincerely thank Councillor Riel for all his work. He's got uh, two big, uh, big uh, reports tonight. But Councillor Baldwin is right. At some point in time, uh, the rubber's going to hit the road. The, the the funding 
the budget for this year is 18.2 million. And, uh, you know, that's the budget. So we will have to find some efficiencies, make some changes and yes, some cuts, um, you know, holiday and holiday service and community busing. What was good at the time, but, uh, maybe, maybe we do have to rethink that now. Uh, we know, we know the numbers, uh, we know the, how much we subsidize it and we know the revenue gap. And I think we can all agree that, uh, you know, there's some significant challenges with transit. It may not, it's not working for everyone. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's a flawed system. And after 12 years of significant investment, we, we do need to, to relook at it. And just quickly, Councillor Hakey's not here, but there are municipalities as we speak who are looking and relooking at transit. One of the reasons they're relooking at it is work from home. Um, are, are, are as many people gonna go downtown as much anymore? Another reason they're looking at it is the cost of diesel. Another reason some are looking at it, believe it or not, is the environment. Do buses with one or two people, does that make sense for the environment? So a lot of communities now are re-looking at transit and we need to do um, for the users, for the union and for the and for the people paying for it. So um, I, I, I support the uh, the uh, deferral. Uh, we do need to have a relook at transit and uh, keep in mind, uh, you know, the dollars and cents do need to be make 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 sense. Um, it's subsidized. It'll continue to be subsidized. But, um, you know, a 60 percent revenue gap when a healthy transit system is 45, we are off and we need to make some uh, changes just to make sure it's a little more effective and efficient for the user and for those paying for it. Any further comments or questions? <laughs> Move by, <laughs> moved by Councillor Riel to defer. We'll take a vote. And that is carried. Thanks, everyone. No notice of motion. We do have another business. I think, Mayor Leal, you had other business? Or I don't know if it was you. I apologize. Who was that? Does it matter as long as someone? Yeah, it's the MCO. Sure. Take your time if you could just read uh, the recommendation into the, into the uh, public uh, domain. This is actually the first time uh, the city is proposing that we use uh, this planning tool that is available to us and has been used by our neighbor municipalities as well. So sorry, um, Councillor Purnell, my fault. Okay. I've just been told that we need uh, a two. So is this a two thirds vote to start the conversation or? Okay. So we'll need a two thirds vote uh, to no debate, but uh, just to add the potential of a minister, a minister's zoning order for a uh, pad paddock would be considered. So we need a two thirds to proceed with that. This is a critical piece for us. So I hope council supports. Okay, so we'll take a vote on that. So that, yeah, there's no, well, yeah, yeah. Touche. Oops. Oh, oh yes, because he's sitting beside me. He moved for his conflicts. Okay, thank you. Do I have to read this whole memo? <laughs> All right, so that is carried. So we can have the debate and discussion. So just the motion, Councillor Purnell, if you can. Okay, let me just find it here, please. I've got the memorandum in front of me. There we go. I apologize. Okay, um, so that council, um, I move that council pass a resolution in support of the request from the Canadian Mental Health Association of Halliburton Corthopine Ridge for a minister zoning order at 24 Paddock Wood to rezone the property from residential district three, that's R.33C to public service district two, uh, PS2, with an exception under section 3.9 of the zoning bylaw to permit a detoxification center and an additional permitted use with a maximum of 12 beds uh, contained within the existing building 
and B, that a copy of Council's resolution be sent to Steve Clark, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, David Smith, MPP for Peterborough Kawartha, Doug Ford, Premier of Ontario, and, and to the Municipal Affairs and Housing Office, <coughs> excuse me, in Kingston, along with a copy of the memorandum. And that memorandum is IPSMEM023-007. And ladies and gentlemen, this is, these are the wraparound services that we desperately need. Thank you very much for that, Councillor Purnell. So you've all heard uh, the motion. Any uh, comments or questions to that? Okay, moved by Councillor Purnell. We'll take a vote. And that is carried. Other business, anyone? All right, motion to adjourn. Councillor Crowley, we'll take a vote. That is carried. Thanks, everyone. Have a good week.